I believe that's everyone now, Chair. I'll just confirm with IT, then we can start the stream. Okay, Chair, we are now live. Oh, good evening and welcome to this Virtual Development Control Committee and welcome to those members of the public watching on the Council's YouTube channel. Uh, I'm Malcolm Self and I'm chairing this uh, meeting this evening. Um, mobile phones, for those in the meeting, please ensure your phones are switched off or in silent mode. I've got to do the same myself um, for the duration of the meeting. Uh, webcasting. This meeting is being broadcast live on the Council's YouTube channel. A copy of the recording will be available on the channel shortly after the meeting. Members and officers are reminded to keep their mic microphones on mute unless they're called on to speak. Uh, members can indicate that they wish to speak using the meeting chat function. Uh, please don't use the chat function to ask questions of officers or councillors because they will not be answered. So if you wish to speak, just type your name, your first name or second name, as you wish. First name's fine in the in the chat function and I'll pick that up. Um, thank you. Uh, Quasi-judicial. Uh, members of the public are reminded that the planning application process is constrained by the need to have regard of current planning policy at national regional and local levels as well as all other material planning considerations including case law president the decision making process is often described as quasi-judicial because local planning authorities have to act reasonably within within the bounds of planning law and the above considerations and are not free to determine planning applications simply because of the weight of public opinion so who's who here this evening? Um, the elected councillors who are present remotely this evening and uh, are members of this committee and will decide what action this committee takes on the issues it considers this evening. Uh, we also have a number of officers present whose cameras are mostly switched off and are here to advise the committee on issues before it. Um, I'll now introduce the councillors and officers of the meeting. So I'll start with councillors first, and I'm just going to go through in alphabetical order. Councillor, see if you can just say good evening or whatever. Councillor Steph Archer. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Councillor Kim Bailey, who's vice chair. Good evening. Good evening. Councillor Mark Banyan. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Uh, Councillor David Cunningham. Good evening. Good evening. Councillor Lorraine Dunstone. Good evening, Chair. Good evening, Councillor Simon Edwards. Uh, good evening, everybody. And those astute amongst you will notice that uh, Councillor Aurora, who is a member of this committee, is unable to attend this evening and attending in his place is Councillor Ian George. So welcome, Ian. Good evening, all. Good evening. Uh, Councillor Leslie Heap. Good evening, Chair. Councillor Dave Ryder-Mills. Good evening, Chair and everyone. Good evening, Councillor Rebecca Mole. Good evening. Good evening. And as I said earlier, I'm Malcolm Self. Um, we also have a councillor who's not member. I'm not a member of the committee this evening. Who's Councillor Sharon Felshikov Sumner, um, and she will be speaking. Assume when we agree that, which I'm sure we will, under procedural rule twenty seven. So if you wish to say hello, Sharon, please do so. Good evening, and thank you, Chair. Good evening. Um, we've got officers. Uh, I won't ask you all to introduce yourself at this point, but we've got Henry Yellop, Democratic Services, Barry Lomax, Head of Development Management, Harsha Bundia, uh, Principal Planner. Planner. I'm not sure if Harsha is actually with us this evening. No, Harsha is not with us this evening. OK. Um, Tim Naylor, Assistant Director of Strategic Planning and Infrastructure. And Toby Felton, Lead Planning Officer, Strategic for strategic, bleep, strategic Major Developments and Planning Delivery. There may be other officers uh, uh, present in an assistance capacity as well. Um, public participation. 
there's a registration scheme for residents and applicants wishing to participate on the planning applications that we're considering. Uh, members of the public who have registered to speak will be contacted at the appropriate time, notifying them to join the meeting. In fact, I think uh, I can't confirm this absolutely, but I think all speakers are already in the meeting. If not, they will be joining very shortly. If we're unable to get in contact with a member of the public uh, they, and they're unable or they're unable to join the meeting, then we will read out on their behalf a written statement which they have supplied to us in advance. Um, I mentioned earlier that Councillor Foucher Kof Sumner is with us this evening. There is a provision under Procedure Rule 27 within the Council's constitution to permit councillors who do not sit on a committee to address this meeting if permission is granted by this permission. Can I quickly check that the committee agrees to permit Councillor Foucher Kof Sumner to speak under Procedure Rule 27? I will pause just for a moment if you've got any objections please put your name in the chat function but i'm sure we'll all agree to that i'll pause just for a moment i can see no hands going up and nothing in the chat function so that's unanimous thank you um the last thing i've got to say before for, for a moment is that we are now in the official election period this is for the election uh, the, the GLA and mayoral elections that happen on May the 6th and we also have a by-election within the borough on that same day. Um, so before we move on to business tonight, all members are reminded that this meeting is taking place during the pre-election period and are asked to refrain from making any comments directly or indirectly about individual candidates in any elections or making any direct link between matters being discussed and any campaign issues. Thank you. That takes us on to apologies for absence and attendance of substitute members. Uh, having gone through the roll call, we know who's here and who's not, but I will ask Henry just to, um, for, for, the, for the record, to uh, give us apologies for absence and, and alternate members. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, Chair. Just to confirm, we have received apologies from Councillor Aurora and Councillor George will be substituting tonight. Thank you very much. Um, Unfortunately, on the minutes, the minutes from the meeting, it wasn't held that long ago. It was held on the 16th of March and they have not yet been published. And so we cannot we will confirm them at a later date. So we've got no minutes to confirm this evening's. And um, that takes us on to declarations of interest. Members are asked to declare any disclosable pecuniary interests and any other non pecuniary interests, i.e. personal interests, relevant to items on this agenda. So if you've got any interest to declare, if you can put your name in the chat function now, uh, I'll pick that up and I'll pause briefly. And there's no names there and there's no waving of hands that I can see or anything like that. So there are no declarations of interest. That now takes us on to the meat of this evening's meeting, uh, which is we have two planning applications and these are two separate applications. We have one full application, 20 oblique 02495 and one outline application, 20 oblique 02499. These are linked as set out in the report. They, they There are one does impact on the other and vice versa. Um, but to be clear, we are first going, starting off with application number 20, oblique 02495, which is the full application for Surrey House, uh, 34 Eden Street, the National uh, Car Park, Car Park, the NCP Car Park next to it, St James's Road, former Hippodrome, uh, Eden, Eden Street and Bow Concept, the Roundhouse 20 Eden Street, Kingston. And it's for the full planning application for the de demolition of Surrey House and all those properties that I've just mentioned and the erection of um, two office buildings, which would be use class E, G, I, buildings A and B, building A being nine storeys, building B being 11 storeys. The erection of a replacement multi-storey car park for three with 354 spaces plus cycle parking for use as a public car park at weekends, landscaping, public realm upgrades, servicing pedestrian and vehicle access. 
Um, this application is accompanied by an environmental statement and it is part it is phase one of a two-stage development as i've just outlined phase two is covered by the other application the outline 120 oblique 02499 and before we go on to the officer's presentation could you indicate if you have not seen the the late material was circulated last week and an additional set of late material was circulated it's not that long but it was circulated um the mid late this afternoon could you indicate if you have not seen that and i will pause to allow all members to read the late material so if you haven't seen there's two sets of late material if you haven't seen those could you just indicate now please and there's no nothing coming up so we've all seen the late material so i'm now going to turn to our our um, head of planning barry lomax to present this item and um hopefully barry you'll be able to give us a very full uh, presentation on this given that it's it's somewhat complex and somewhat technical but over to you barry thank you thank you mr chairman can you see the presentation on your screens i can see it on my screen i hope it's i hope it's on all screens but there we are uh, so uh, as you've indicated mr chairman the the application in front of us is a is a large application and as such you have to indulge me the presentation is also uh, rather long however i'll try and uh, get through it as quickly as possible so the application will cover both sets of applications for for parts where there is some commonality and then we'll go into detail of the separate applications and go through the weighing balancing exercise for each application separately so on screen now you see the description of the two separate applications the full planning application on the left hand side for the demolition of Surrey House uh, site with the multi-storey car park, the Bow Concept, the Hippodrome and its redevelopment for uh, office accommodation, two office buildings, a replacement multi-storey car park with landscaping and public realm works. And then on the right hand side you see the description for the outline planning application which is outline planning permission for the demolition of the existing Lever House and the erection of a residential building not exceeding 16 storeys comprising a maximum of 115 units all matters reserved except for access layout and scale both applications are accompanied by an environmental statement the first application on the left hand side constitutes phase one and the application on the right hand side phase two on the screen now on the left hand left and right hand side you see the site areas for both the relevant site for each application outlined in red so the full application includes the bow concept surrey house hippodrome and multi-story car park and the outline covers lever house and the area down by the hogsmill river uh, looking on site now we just see a reference to the individual buildings on site and then we see some aerial photography showing lever house at the front the tallest building on site with the multi-storey car park behind the hippodrome surrey house office accommodation at upper floors retail below and then the bow concept building also referred to in the report as the roundhouse building on screen now you just see the same image taken from different sides with brook street the area uh, heavily trafficked by by buses at st james road eden street and then as i say from other points on site. Here we have some photography of the site as it was uh, before uh, demolition works have started on some parts of the site. So at the top you see the rather outdated office accommodation on the right hand side Surrey House, a four-storey building from the 1970s. On the left hand side the multi-storey car park. Again on the bottom left the, the car park uh, taken from Brook Street. Then on the right hand side uh, you see Surrey House with the retail units below. Then we see the Bow Concept building at the top left going round in uh, a clockwise fashion. We see the multi-storey car park entrance going round to the Hogsmill River and then back to the entrance to the Hippodrome. And then on screen now you see four shots of the Hogsmill area to the south of Lever House, which has elements of public realm, which is uh, relatively unused, as you can see by the photographs. But now I thought it'd be uh, prudent to give an overview of the planning policies relevant for this site. So on screen you see the 
proposals map, proposal sites taken out of the Kingston Area Action Plan 2008. And what this plan identifies is this quarter of the town centre, indicated here by P4, P3, P2 and P14, has been allocated since 2008 for a significant degree of change. What you will note, and it is set out in the report, that P4 leaves out Lever House out of the application site and that is explained in 2008 given that Lever House had undergone recent refurbishments and at the time wasn't deemed to be potential for redevelopment. This application includes within the scope of the, re the redevelopment of the island site at Lever House. Uh, now we see some of the figure plans taken out of the London plan. Taken from left we see the town centre network with Kingston clearly identified as a metropolitan centre. Uh, looking in the middle and on the far right we look at the growth potential for residential and office as set out in the London plan, both showing high potential for residential and commercial growth and that is as set out in the table at the bottom of your screen taken from the London plan. Uh, now following on from the 2008 Area Action Plan, which identified Eden Quarter as an area which would be likely to significant change, the Council produced some guidance called the Eden Quarter Development Brief. It's very important to stress that the Eden Quarter Development Brief is not policy, it is a supplementary planning document, it does not have the force of policy, should not be interpreted as policy, it is guidance, but it is nonetheless guidance which is a consideration and carries weight. Taking you around the screen and some of the key images from the SPD. You see at the top left hand side the guidance on building heights and the heat map that goes with it. Clearly identifying here guidance that six to eight stories across the site with nine plus stories at the corner site of the old post office and then again on Eden Street by uh, Neville uh, Road car park. However it is important to note and we'll come on to this later on that there has been flexibility in the application and implementation of the guidance with regards to the other major sites which surround this one. At the bottom right hand side you see Eden Square as set out in the Eden Quarter Development Brief which is an aspiration of the brief to provide an area of enhanced public realm. Now you see Eden Square uh, envisages the building fronting onto Eden Street aligning with the, the post office and with the area in front becoming a, in the long term, a shared surface, service, surface rather, uh, but in the short term, capable of being used as public open space. At the bottom left hand side, you see the outline of the Eden Quarter development brief. And on the top right hand side, you see the artist's impression of Eden Square and Surrey House redevelopment as set out in the Eden Quarter development brief seeing the building step back to reveal the old post office with um, common paving across, although this art, uh, image shows um, segregation, not a shared surface, with some tree planting along the front. Uh, looking now at some of the key site constraints, on the left hand side we see the site sits in between two conservation areas. To the right hand side, as you see it on my screen and your screen, you see the Fairfield conservation area. To the left hand side you see the Kingston Old Town Conservation Area, the red dots on screen indicate listed buildings and the green dots indicate locally listed buildings with the yellow dot indicating the site. Key listed buildings uh, within the context of the site is United Reformed Church which sits across from the site, the old post office which sits to the north east of the site, the exchange building which sits to the far east and then you have the Guild Hall and the collection of listed buildings and locally listed buildings within the marketplace, which has a group value for its heritage and listed buildings, but also has the marketplace at its heart, which is a listed building in its own right of great importance. In the middle screen, you see the tree preservation orders around the site. And then on the far right hand side, you see the key views as indicated in the area action plan. The individual hatched lines indicate those uh, views. Key here is is view four down St James's, uh, a view of the All Saints Church spire and we'll cover that when we look at the uh, imagery uh, in a second. Uh, view two taken from Hampton Court Palace across to All Saints uh, Church and then you see going off the screen in the northern direction is a view from Richmond Park and you just can't quite see possibly on screen 
a blue hazy image that's showing that the whole site falls within the viewing corridor from thatched cottage down into Kingston. Again, we'll cover that in more detail in some of the imagery which we're coming up. Looking now at the planning context of the site, this image shows how this quarter of the town has, under, under, has undergone significant change in terms of permissions and some of it being built out, as members will know. Uh, you see at the right hand side, the Royal Exchange, uh, also known colloquially as the old post office. To the north of that, the Eden Walk uh, development. And then the rendered imagery in the middle is the proposed scheme members are assessing this evening. Uh, the Royal Exchange development is out of the ground, significantly out of the ground. And the Eden Walk development has legally commenced, is extant and can continue at any point. Uh, looking now at the Royal Exchange building, uh, the Royal Exchange building, which sits next to the site, has a very tall uh, building at the top site, the 16 storey, stepping down to a range of four to, uh, 10 storeys around. Here we have in elevational form, this is the Brook Street elevation, showing that Brook Street frontage at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 storeys. Um, you'll note that the, the brief has, a, uh, has a, a less than 10 at this part of the site. And then we see the taller element at 16 storeys. Uh, moving around to the Wheatfield Way elevation, the central uh, part of this elevation at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 storeys again, stepping up to the 16 on the corner. Uh, this is a rendered image of what the building will look like when it's finally completed. Now turning to the Eden Walk development to the north of the application site, uh, again, uh, a, a modern development, commercial mixed with residential, commercial at the ground uh, floors with residential above at the podium level, four floors of retail uh, and commercial fo followed by residential development. Uh, this again is a rendered image taken from the end of Brook Street and taken from the end of Eden Street showing those four floors of retail with residential above. And uh, Building heights range here from the four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve stories to fourteen stories to sixteen stories. Uh, again, showing the flexibility in the application of the Eden Quarter Development Brief as applications has come forward. If I now take you in more detail in to the applications we're dealing with, first the full application twenty oblique zero two four nine five. Uh, this application is for full planning permission for the erection of two office buildings, use class E.G. I, what we might have previously known as office accommodation, uh, with a link at the ground floor on the sixth floor. Uh, the two buildings, building A and B, building A would be nine storeys, six storeys with a step back uh, and then a further step back at eight storeys to the ninth, and then building B, 11 storeys. It is proposed for the erection of a replacement multi-storey car park to replace the NCP car park. Currently on site, there would be 354 spaces four spaces of which would be reserved for the residential development if permitted. There would be 466 cycle spaces in the basement along with showering facilities uh, comprising 450 long stay and 16 short stay spaces, uh, 25 motorcycle spaces, 21 blue badge spaces, 70 spaces with electrical charging provision with the rest of the spaces having passive charging provision, 24 of those would be rapid charging, 46 would be fast charging. Uh, there would be public access to the car park at weekends. Uh, the application also includes the public realm uh, upgrades to the surrounding streets, uh, landscaping. As we've already covered, this application is phase one of the two-stage development. Phase two is covered by the second application on the agenda this evening. This application is accompanied by environmental statement. And it's important to note, members might have seen this as they've been wandering around uh, town, that Part of the building is already undergoing demolition, and that is as a result of four prior approval applications which have been granted uh, for the demolition of elements of the site, not including Lever House, but the other elements. So on screen now, uh, we see the application site. And the, the main uh, or the only parts for the outline of the full rather are A, B and C, the Honey Building, the Hive Building and the Beekeepers Building, as indicated on screen. Uh, let's have a look at building A. Uh, so building A has a, a gross external area of about 22,000 square meters. And as you go along the square uh, footage at different measurements, it, it obviously changes. And then we see the, flip, the footprint, the ground floor level of the site showing a stepped entrance from Eden Street into an area of ancillary retail provision. I say ancillary because that would be linked to the occupier 
of the office accommodation and would be ancillary to their main uh, office use. Uh, this building having a, a step back would have a, a generous pavement of around 4.6 metres. You see proposed planting at the front of the building and then you see this step back which we we'll see uh, in slightly more detail here in line with the post office to create the start of Eden Square. At the bottom here you see a photo uh, montage uh, CGI of that entrance into those ancillary retail units at the ground floor. Uh, this is a typical office place, office floor plate through the building, the central core having the uh, uh, circulation uh, facilities and toilet facilities with office accommodation around the first floor onto the typical floor plate. And as you get up to the building at the sixth, it steps back with a roof terrace uh, around. And then as we get up to the eighth, again, a further setback. Here we see the building in elevational form, showing that setback at the sixth and eighth floor. The building having a, a architecturally uh, quiet, calm appearance with these two-storey uh, bays, giving a, 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 uh, some architectural uh, wizardry to make the building uh, appear uh, less, less, um, less bulky or, or, or less uh, at scale. And then we see a cut through through the building showing that circulation space in the middle. Uh, looking now at the heights at that eaves height where that first step back is, you're looking at 25 meters, uh, stepping up to 32 meters, and then again at the top, 37 meters uh, above the pavement level. Sorry. And then the taller elements of the neighboring building B stepping up to uh, 49, 45, and 41 meters, respectively. Here we see a uh, an artist impression of the building with a segment through showing the details of that facade with the materials uh, set out at the bottom here with curtain wall glazing, feature metal mesh spandrel panels, insulated painted glass panels, uh, spandrels rather, uh, mullion caps, uh, glazed brick with a teal green colour and pre-cast stone panelling. Of course, if members were minded to grant permission, materials would be subject to uh, further applications by way of conditions. The image on screen there shows the setback and the terracing at the sixth and the eighth floors. And then looking now at the uh, ancillary retail units, which we access from a raised uh, platform back from the pavement uh, with steps and ramped uh, entrance in. Uh, this bottom image showing how uh, seating would be provided along this um, access into the retail units. And then finally, some CGI imagery of how building A uh, might look. Again, further imagery. Now, looking at the entrance link bridge uh, element, building A is connected or would be connected to building B at ground and sixth floor. At ground floor, you see here uh, the proposed entrance off Brook Street with circulation space access to the right to building A, to the left to building B. Here we see a CGI of that entrance building and on the left hand side a plan showing access in, breakout space either side and then access through to the woodland walk in the central courtyard. And then at the higher level we see the proposed link at the sixth floor Again, in a floor plan showing breakout space being connected in both buildings. And here we have a cut through section showing how the link uh, might look. Now turning to building B, building B being on facing Brook Street. Again, showing the floor areas with the uh, gross external area of around 11,500 square meters. And then we see building B floor plan again showing this access area of Brook Street into office accommodation with that circulation and uh, facilities at the ground floor moving up through the floors with the step back at the 10th floor to provide the terrace. The architectural language uh, following the architectural language of building A showing heights as indicated on screen 49.1 meters to the very top of the building with the step back here at 41 uh, meters. Then we have this section through showing the detailing again with a similar palette of materials to the building A. Here we have some imagery showing what that terrace 
uh, might look like at the tenth floor, uh, the green roofs on the buildings, and again that terrace. Uh, the rear of building B into the courtyard has a slightly different uh, appearance given the uh, circulation space, so there are proposed uh, rain panelling into that courtyard from building B. Uh, this shows the CGI image of the entrance from Brook Street into building B and also into building A. Uh, now moving to the multi-storey car park, building C. There would be 350 spaces in the car park for office accommodation, four for residential parking, uh, 25 uh, accessible spaces for uh, disabled parking and 12 accessible cycle parking spaces. Here we see a layout of the car park with uh, cycle storage in the basement with showering and changing facilities, moving up through the floors, uh, showing parking, and then at the top floor, a roof terrace amenity deck uh, with a photophotallic array uh, to provide energy to the buildings. As part of the proposal, access uh, would be afforded members of the public to the roof terrace on an agreed management um, plan basis, which would be agreed by way of legal agreement. Here we see some uh, cross sections and elevations of the building, uh, as one would imagine how a car park would work. Uh, the applicants have worked to demonstrate how this building is capable of being repurposed in the future with um, little uh, architectural uh, changes made. It has been designed so as to be easily uh, converted or um, easily uh, within reason uh, for future uses. Uh, the application, which members will have seen, the members of the public will have seen, shows how it could be converted into a residential use, office use, or hotel use. Here we see elevations of the uh, car park at the bottom right hand side, showing a maximum uh, height of around 25 metres and uh, 21 metres at this point. Uh, on screen now, you just see some further information with regards to the electrical uh, charging provision point showing the rapid, fast charging facilities, the accessible spaces, uh, and some uh, details on the left-hand side about accessible and motorcycle parking, which we've already covered. Here we see some detailing of the building now, the mesh perforated metal panels. Uh, this would be part of, if approved, a public art with um, a motif cut metal panel captured by uh, conditions with glazed brick slips, a video display wall, a photo photallic array. So the application on St. James includes for uh, video display panels. Uh, the details of that would need to be secured by future advertisement consent. But this is so as to keep some animation down St. James uh, Road, given that the base uh, would be a car park and very difficult to animate the base of a car park. Here we see the uh, computer generated imagery of the car park showing the main um, pedestrian access, car park access, the rear courtyard uh, access and then the cycle access from the in, in a green walk. Then looking at the amenity deck at the roof, showing uh, laid out landscaping, amenity deck with a photo array, as I say, with access by arrangement uh, to the roof area for members of the public. One of the key areas of the multi-storey car park is the green living wall, uh, shown here facing the uh, proposed residential building. Uh, this would be secured and controlled by condition if members were minded to approve. Uh, looking now at the public realm elements of the full application. Firstly, looking at landscaping, the application does propose the removal of uh, the application proposed removal of six trees, two of which uh, officers uh, do not agree with their removal. They are the category A trees as listed on screen. However, the other trees, uh, regrettably, are required to facilitate the development and subject to uh, a robust landscaping strategy. The Council's tree and landscape officer has no objection. The trees that are removed would be uh, replaced by extensive uh, planting, the urban uh, greening uh, factor for both sites at 0 0.4, uh, 0 0.42, I think, is in excess of the London plan standard. Looking now at the public realm details for the surfacing of the roads around the application site, on screen now we see the proposal for the upgrade of Eden Street outside of the site. 
uh, the proposed raised uh, carriageway to connect to connect both sides of Eden Street, therefore going some way to facilitate the provision of Eden Square. It is important to note at this point that it is not incumbent on any one development to provide Eden Square. The developments in and of themselves are not to prejudice or prevent. Indeed, they are to contribute. This development contributing the public realm improvements, the old post office contributing the improvements around the post office for the public realm, and then the Eden Walk development proposing the repaving of that side of the, of the road again would be controlled by condition or that is controlled by condition for Eden, uh, Eden Walk and uh, this would all come together to form the basis of Eden Square. Now down both sides of the surrounding roads again a uh, proposed uh, carriageway increase so as to connect the open space at the post office to the front of the building, uh, repaving of the pavements around the sides and again, some reinstatements of crossovers and new crossovers along St. James Road. On screen now, you see an image of the internal walkway uh, with permitted access to members of the public during office hours and weekend hours. Uh, will be captured by way of condition. On screen now, you see the imagery showing the raising of of the pavements here, the increase in width of the pavement running down St. James's. And again here, you can just see in the far distance, the increase in public realm works to the front, and you can't quite see to the side here. Uh, now looking at the second proposal, which is the outline, the plans for that 20 oblique 02499 oblique out. Uh, this is a planning application which seeks outline permission for the comprehensive residential-led redevelopment of the Lever House site for a building of up to 16 storeys, providing up to 215 dwellings with a cafe use at ground floor. Uh, the application also includes proposals for the regeneration of the public realm around the Hogs Mill. The application is in outline with all matters reserved, save for appearance and landscaping. What does that mean? That means that Members here are assessing the scale of the building, a building of up to 16 storeys, the quantum of development up to 115 uh, units and the layout of the building, where it sits on the ground and how the building is accessed. How the building would be clothed or cloaked, the appearance would be subject to future considerations if members were minded to approve, as would matters pertaining to landscaping, that would be controlled by reserve matters application at a future point if members were minded to approve. Uh, the application uh, would include 36 affordable dwellings. Uh, that is an increase from uh, the start of the application process. They would be 20 at a social rent, 16 uh, shared ownership. 10 of the units would be available for affordable purchase. Uh, this equates to 35% of the total on habitable rooms as per, as per the London plan uh, policy, 31% of the total units. Uh, the proposed mix would be as follows, three bedroom, 26%, two bedroom, 24%, one bedroom, 50%. However, that would be subject to review as and when uh, the reserve matters come forward if the application were to be approved. 10% of the units would be wheelchair user dwellings with 90% accessible and adaptable. There would be on-site play space for younger children with financial contribution to older children play space off-site captured by way of legal agreement. Uh, the development will contain a cafe at the ground floor with external terrace along with a residence lounge and parent seating area. There would be four blue badge spaces within uh, the multi-storey car park, again, if the first phase is, is approved. There would be extensive uh, regeneration improvements to the Hogsmill River, again captured by legal agreement, as well as the creation of a green street, uh, not a through route. Uh, this comprises the second phase of a two-stage development. This application is accompanied um, by an environmental statement. And a note at the bottom here, uh, just re-emphasizing that an ap application of outline planning permission is used to establish whether in principle the development would be acceptable. This type of planning application allows fewer details about the proposal to be submitted. Notwithstanding, the applicant has submitted indicative plans showing how 115 units could be delivered on site in a building with a maximum height of 16 storeys. Uh, this has been assessed through the environmental statement and through the trans the townscape visual impact and heritage assessments. Uh, there you see a, a CGI imagery of the 
residential building, how it might look. And then uh, on screen now, I, I won't, I'm not going to take you through this in detail. This shows uh, access with the social rented properties, at the lower ground floor levels, the third floor, and a mix of markets and affordable. And then as you rise up through the building, uh, there's affordable on the eighth floor and then market uh, from the ninth floor onwards. Here we see an indicative floor plan with that child's outdoor play space at the front of the building, uh, access to the cafe and cafe terrace along the side, a proposed new footpath route between Wheatfield Way and St. James's Road with access down to the proposed improvements to the Hogs Mill. Here we see a residence amenity deck, a young children secure play area watched over by a parent's seating area for residents. And then we have refuge and cycle storing on the ground floor with lift access through the building, two lifts accessing the floors. Here we see an indicative plan showing the proposed possible materials. Again, if members are minded to approve, this would be subject to reserve matters applications. Uh, looking at fluted ceramic precast panels, precast pre cast spran, pre cast spran, spandrels, aluminium framed glazing, aluminium louvers, metal fre uh, fretted balustrading and metal fretted panels. Here we see some indicative floor plans. Uh, members will note in the report that there are a couple of units on each floor which fall uh, below the space standards by 10 square metres. Uh, it's also noted that this is captured by legal agreement for a review to ensure that all future units meet the space standards and that would be a requirement of legal of a legal agreement if members were minded to approve all flats have access to external uh, balconies at varying lengths which with the under provision where there is under provision captured in communal space at the ground floor in line with council's residential design supplementary planning document here we see some indicative plans showing how uh, the building might look. Again, this will be subject to future applications if approved. And then again, a indicative plan showing the cafe at ground floor with access to the Hawks Mill on the right hand side. Again, a CGI showing the building and looking at the landscaping uh, details. Here we see on screen now how the landscaping in this area in front of the Hawks Mill uh, might look. The principle of the regeneration of the site would be captured by legal agreement with a requirement for the full details to be secured at phase two, if members were minded to approve. Uh, this application involves the removal of six trees on site. These are indicated on screen, again, subject to a landscaping condition as set out in the agenda papers. Uh, the train landscape officer is confident uh, or is uh, certain that their loss could be mitigated through a landscaping scheme. Again, looking at the proposed landscaping and the urban greening factor of 0.42 uh, above the London plan standard. If I now take you to the planning assessment, just after I have a little sip of water. Looking first at the daylight and sunlight. So here we first see some overshadowing details shown at the proposal on March the 21st and June the 21st, uh, showing the existing shadowing and the proposed shadowing. Uh, what this shows is the central courtyard from around uh, midday through to two o'clock in the afternoon has uh, sunlight. At other parts of the day, there would be overshadowing to that central space. Uh, the Eden Square uh, would have some overshadowing, uh, as it would in line with the Eden Street or even quarter development brief buildings of six to eight stories as the sun moves around later in the day at the high uh, sun uh, summer period this area is is uh, relieved of shadow later in the afternoon looking now at the buildings which have the greatest or are subject to the greatest impact as set out in the report so what i have on screen now is the vertical sky component of the Brook Street, the old post office buildings. Why, what I have on the left hand side is the existing units that fail or fall below a vertical sky component at 13%. 13% being the figure which the mayor uses in his good quality consultation guide or guide out for consultation. As we go to the right hand side, what we have is the proposed scheme showing the windows which would fall below 13% as a result of the development. 
at the bottom, we have what's been indicated as a mirrored scheme. And what the mirrored scheme is, the British uh, residential, um, I think it's right, I forget what the R stands for in the BRE guidance, but BRE guidance nonetheless, sets out that where a scheme has a disproportionate amount of light, so this in this case would be Brook Street, i.e. a tall building on the boundary next to another site, it is reasonable to use a different measure. And that measure can be a mirrored image. So a mirror of the old post office scheme projected onto the Surrey house site and then looking at what would that be. So you see, if we had a mirrored image, the windows which would fall below that 13% are pretty similar to the windows which fall below the 13% as a result of the development with an increase over this side and an increase over this side. Uh, looking at some of these figures do drop down into very low single digit uh, figures, but looking at this in conjunction with other assessments, the uh, no skyline, average daylight factor, the rooms which are affected the most, the data would show that whilst it would be noticeable, those rooms that might rely on artificial lighting in the winter would continue to rely on artificial lighting in the winter and same in the summer. If a room um, in this scheme relies on artificial lighting in the summer, in late afternoon, it would continue to rely on artificial lighting in the summer. Some of the differences in the average daylight factor are such that uh, whilst noticeable, it would be acceptable in an urban area such as this. This would be the same for the Eden Street development to St. James Road, the properties above the little parade of shops, the um, uh, pizza place and the kebab shop and the nail shop. Uh, they all uh, benefit from greater than 13 uh, percent vertical sky component. But one thing we need to bear in mind here, the guidance in the London plan, the guidance in the national planning policy framework is that we need to apply daylight and sunlight standards flexibly so as to optimise housing delivery. And if this scheme was to follow in strict accordance with the Eden Quarter development brief, the windows at the ground floor would still experience some of these low levels of vertical sky component that we see now. Uh, this part of the presentation We'll cover some of the view, or we'll cover the significant views in some detail. Uh, looking first at that protected view that we spoke about from Richmond Park, looking down into Kingston. Uh, the top view is the actual view, which is in the study. The bottom one is zoomed in. Of course, that is not what one would see unless uh, one was uh, benefiting from uh, binoculars. But at the top, you see that the blue line, which is this development, sits in front of the orange line, which is the old post office, and yellow line, which is Eden Walk. It sits at the skyline, not above, as you can see here, just on that skyline. Moreover, when sitting at the, the bench at Thatch Lodge, looking into Kingston, uh, what you're seeing is a very difficult to pinpoint any individual buildings apart from in this location here. Uh, you can see the Kingston Riverside scheme uh, permitted uh, by the inspectorate some time, some time ago. But the conclusion here uh, submitted by the applicants agreed by the council's heritage consultants is that this would not have a significant effect on the view from Richmond Park, the protected view, given the existing buildings which are in this site Moreover, given the college building which sits behind the site, this sitting just above the college building, it running in line with the Surrey Hills and therefore also not affecting um, the, the Guild Hall or the important um, All Saints Church building, uh, officers consider that this impact uh, would not be detrimental to that protected view. Uh, looking now at the views from Hampton Court uh, Palace, this is the uh, view uh, down to all Saints Church, you'll see that the buildings are covered by the trees and as such the impact is is minimal. And then a view from the Shepherd's Cottages. Uh, this is the view which Richmond Borough Council have raised concerns with. Uh, those concerns are not echoed by the historic royal palaces who, as you see in the late material, do not object to the proposal, uh, nor are 
Richmond Borough Council's views uh, shared by Historic England, who also don't raise concerns with this uh, view. Officers consider that this view, when taken with uh, other buildings here, is detrimental to the view out of the park at the Shepherd's Cottages. Uh, this is taken from Heron, Heron Pond in uh, Bushy Park, looking out. And again, given the buildings which surround it, officers consider also given that the materials of the taller element of building would be for subject assessment and would have to go again through a view study to minimise any impact, officers consider that again this would be a minimal impact on those views. Uh, looking now uh, in Bushy Park through, through the uh, Diana Fountain, you'll see that uh, the impact is, is masked by existing features. And then turning, turning now to Barge Walk South, walking along uh, the Barge Walk. Uh, we see here the taller element of the building out of the view of the Guild Hall. And then with the office building maintaining the prominence of the spire of the Guild Hall uh, in this view, Again, in this view, uh, you see uh, the Charter Key development, the blue being the proposed scheme, uh, filling in uh, this gap already, the gap already um, significantly completed by the, blue, the orange outline being the old post office site. And then here we have the scheme uh, which officers have highlighted as causing harm. And this is uh, the proposed residential building sitting behind the spire of the guild hall now whilst officers do uh, acknowledge harm we do acknowledge that it is at the lower end of the spectrum given that a uh, the uh, observer will be able to appreciate the separation distances the taller element would be in the background with the guild hall in the foreground also uh, the the spire element is preserved uh, from the building the silhouette is preserved and that will be uh, maintained um, through the discharge of conditions in members minded to approve with regards to materials given the materials are not uh, approved at this point uh, any building there would have to be of a very light material so as not to shadow uh, the silhouette of the guild hall and then you see the view from the uh, bridge again this is a view which initially at 22 stories historic england had concerns with at 16 stories they now do not raise this as a particular concern they acknowledge that it no longer competes with the All Saints Church as a dominant feature within the view and the entrance into the conservation area. You see yellow, the yellow buildings here being the uh, uh, Eden Walk scheme and the orange building back here being the old post office. Here we now have the view from Thames Street. Again, this is a view which officers consider is harmful, albeit less as substantial, uh, given that it breaks the roofscape of the marketplace when viewed from three to five Thames Street and also when viewed from one Thames Street. What we see here is that view above the roofscape, the roof line, is already punctured by the old post office. This development would uh, cover the impact of the old post office, but also increase with the uh, residential tower. Uh, officers have worked with the developer, unlike the previous scheme, to ensure that this is broken up. There's greater articulation in that uh, roof element, greater articulation in the facades. It is a much simpler, calmer architectural language. And whilst we consider this to be less harmful than the previous scheme, the appeal scheme, um, officers still acknowledge that it would impact on the uh, marketplace, the historic buildings contained within, given the group uh, value and the Kingston Town Conservation Area. Uh, this is a view taken from the market place showing that uh, you might just see the very top of the building from this place within the marketplace and then this is where my or the council's technology may give up but let's see whether we can play the animation so this is the animation video in the marketplace as you would walk through the marketplace, a kinetic view uh, with the office accommodation. So here we are walking now, you see the office accommodation, and as you continue to walk, you see the office accommodation falling behind the roofscape, but you do see the um, Eden Walk on the left-hand side. Of course, more prominent because it's coloured yellow. Um, that, again, would be more muted uh, if um, or when 
developed. We're now walking towards a guild hall. The building doesn't impact on that important view of the guild hall from the marketplace. Uh, we then get to the end of the marketplace, and as we turn left, we see the proposal coming into view on the right-hand side. With so, the, sorry, Jack, I can't uh, see. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Oh, oh something's just peered up. I couldn't see anything until just that moment, and now it's come on my screen. I don't know if anyone else had the same. Sorry, uh, Barry. I don't know if you can go back. No, no. Did, um, let me see if I can. I'll take it back. I'll try and take it back. You really are pushing the boundaries of the council's computer system now. Let's see whether it copes with being forced to rewind. Are you able to see that, Councillor Benyon? Yeah, I can see that at the moment. Yes, thank you. So here we are again, walk, walking through the marketplace. You see the buildings here, and as you have a kinetic view walking through the marketplace, uh, the buildings uh, reduce in uh, in their visual zone of influence. This is acknowledged by Historic England in their latest comments. They acknowledge that uh, this view or this piece of um, work does demonstrate that from a kinetic view, uh, you very quickly lose the impact. Now, moving to the left on Eden Street, we see the old post office in the distance. We see Eden Walk on the left-hand side, and then we see the proposed building on the right hand side and then as we turn around and we look down St James's Road we see the residential building in the background with the car park in the middle. Uh, looking now from Clatton Bridge, uh, this is an important view uh, identified by the inspectorate in their appeal decision, uh, paragraph 39 of the appeal decision which members uh, have seen. Uh, what we see now is the existing scheme. What is important to note is the inspector discussed harm to the Guild Hall from this view and the next view, and I should take you through both. This is Clatton Bridge showing the existing Surrey House. This is Clatton Bridge showing the old post office. You'll see the old post office scheme uh, popping out uh, at the edge of the, um, uh, the rounded element of the Guild Hall and then uh, running to the top of Surrey House. You see the proposed building, uh, the proposed building being a much calmer building, less uh, complicated architecture. The building has a much simpler, although uh, uh, well-designed elevation facade. It picks up on important elements in the area, the rounded uh, corners, which you see in the Guild Hall and you see in other elements uh, around. This building has a lower uh, shoulder height. When I take you to the other view, well, that will become more apparent than the appeal scheme. This being the appeal scheme. See, the appeal scheme has a, a more complicated uh, architectural facade of darker materials competing with both uh, the ZZ restaurant and uh, the Guild Hall on the right hand side. Uh, so, the different uh, materials, architectural language, form, and architectural lack of articulation at roof level is what was argued by the historic advisor appointed by the council working with me at the previous public inquiry whereas we think this scheme being a much simpler architecture rounded corners softer lighter materials calmer appearance does not have the same issues now this again when taken with the view from the rear so the inspector at paragraph 39 referenced both view seven and nine when seen from the high street and from the footpath along the hogsmill river this is from said footpath at the Hogsmill River. Uh, what we see here is a greater breakup of this building. The inspector was mindful of the uh, St. James uh, run of the previous building being quite an extensive run. This is the appeal scheme uh, previously with lack of articulation at the roof line, a very flat uh, in, in, in articulate uh, front elevation, uh, dark materials, a very solid building, which seen uh, in a context of the Guild Hall, uh, concluded it had a detrimental impact on the setting of the Guild Hall. Uh, officers do not share uh, that opinion, they do not follow through with this uh, development. It is a different piece of architecture, it has greater articulation, it is different materials, it's a different architectural language, and as a result, a different conclusion. So if I just toggle through here, it is this view and that view which the inspector decided taking together was harmful to the Guild Hall. It is this view and this view which the council's heritage advisor agrees with the applicant's heritage consultant that wouldn't have a harmful impact on the setting of the Guildhall in this case. 
Uh, moving now at the view of Eden Street from Union Street. Uh, this shows United Reformed Church on the left-hand side looking over at the uh, proposed building. Again, the building on the left-hand side, a listed building, the significance set out in great detail in the report, uh, showing uh, this is, a, again, different architecture with a greater uh, depth uh, in terms of that central public realm area, a softer building, lighter materials, uh, the double bay uh, minimising its impact in terms of scale. It's set back at the shoulder height of, of the six uh, storeys, making the building at uh, road level, highway level, appear uh, much smaller than the, or much um, shorter than the appeal scheme. The appeal scheme being, as you see on screen now, the inspector decided that this scheme had a detrimental impact on the United Reformed Church. We consider that this development doesn't have that same impact, again, because of the reasons already discussed, the uh, architecture. This building being uh, what is a complicated architectural uh, language, solid materials, a, a rather flat frontage with a tall element at uh, this side and a, a much taller shoulder height at the United Reformed Church. Uh, the proposed scheme being different, we arrived at a different conclusion. It is important here just to note, we are not assessing this scheme against the appeal scheme. We are assessing this scheme on its own merits, but the appeal scheme is a consideration of significant weight and importance. Going now closer to the old post office, again, another listed building in the town centre of importance. Uh, you'll remember I previously spoke about Eden Square requiring the building to be stepped back uh, from uh, the post office to give the post office greater space to breathe, to provide access to the public realm around the post office, but also to facilitate the provision of Eden Square. The proposed development steps back from this building. Unfortunately, uh, there is a tree in this image, but that tree is taken away in this image. So you see the building is noticeably stepped back in line with the brief showing that building, uh, the listed building in um, greater, a greater space. Uh, as search officers consider, taking into account the architectural language, the materials, the lower uh, shoulder height, we think that this building has less of an impact than this building, which was the appeal scheme on the post office. So looking, you see at the bottom, the, the, the imagery is taken with slightly different cameras, although not from significantly different vantage points. But you see the building at that point previously was significantly taller than the building that has been proposed, in particular with the shoulder height and the step backs compared to the previous scheme. But again, important to reiterate, we're not here to compare the proposal to the appeal scheme. We're here to assess the proposal on its own merits, although the appeal scheme is of significant uh, weight. Let's have a sip of water. Here we see the Eden uh, Street um, development in some context of that Eden Square that we spoke about and the stepping back to provide with this curved frontage a greater space here for public realm works. And then looking at uh, Eden Street from, from number 80 further down, in particular with the old post office, as you can see on the front here, uh, this is the scheme which members are assessing now. This is the appeal scheme, much taller at the corner. This scheme, through work with the Design Review Panel, Council's Urban Design Officers, has moved to focus height at the other end of the building so as to ensure less height at this end, so as to minimise impact on those um, heritage assets. And what we see now is the site plan, com site plan comparison showing how that viewpoint has been increased. This dotted blue line shows existing Surrey House canopy line. Uh, you'll notice the canopy uh, projects forward. You then see the existing Surrey House uh, footprint. You see this red line here, which is the previous appeal outline with this hashed, hatched line and dark black line showing the proposed Eden campus entrance. This is the start of the steps and forward, showing the stepping back at this point, creating that space for Eden Square. Uh, looking now from Fairfield Park, the conservation area, looking in, uh, you see Eden Walk the post office and the proposed development as indicated on screen on the left and right hand side of the, of the post office. Again, officers conclude, given the existing uh, development in this area, this would not have 
a detrimental impact on that conservation area. And then also looking for on Pendrin Road. Again, we consider uh, when viewed as you walk down Pendrin Road, you see the building, although much taller than the college building and the multi-storey um, car park and courthouse, it is of a sympathetic height to these buildings. All of these buildings would be classed in the London plan definition as tall buildings being taller than six storeys. Uh, this is the protective view we spoke about or I spoke about at the start of the presentation, showing that view from the area action plan looking down St. James's Road. As you can see here, this is the development on screen. That view to the All Saints Church would not be affected by the proposed development. Uh, what we're looking at now is the, uh, the key areas of assessment of the outlaw of the full scheme. We will then pause uh, for the recommendation on the full and then we will come back for the considerations of the outline. So looking now at the key considerations of the commercial development, looking at the economic um, proposals for this. So building A and building B together would have a uh, gross internal area of about 32,500 uh, square metres. That would net off as internal area of about 25,000 square metres. Using the HCA, the Homes Communities Agency's Density Guide for Employment, uh, that net internal area would give rise to a potential employment capacity of around 2,000 full-time jobs. The regeneration team of the council also consider that that could uh, development of this side, sorry, development of this side could net size could net around 262 full-time equivalent construction jobs, with approximately 335 contract workers per year. There would be an approximate 16,000 square meter increase in commercial space across both sites bearing in mind that the Lever House site has office accommodation on it already. Uh, the application would require the uh, agreement of an employment and skills package. Uh, that would uh, look to secure construction apprenticeships, uh, local employment during the construction phase, construction work experience opportunities, end use uh, or end user rather that should be apprenticeships, local procurement opportunities and then £50,000 for the implementation of that package. Also secured would be 232,000 towards Kingston's work match job brokerage service, a service uh, put forward by the council in light of the uh, COVID pandemic. And then also 250,000 pounds towards the delivery of flexible, affordable workspace elsewhere within the town center. Uh, two other key considerations is the loss of the Hippodrome. This is a, a an issue which was debated at great length at the public inquiry with the inspector concluding that sufficient evidence was placed in front of him to demonstrate that the hippodrome was no longer required given that the facilities that it once provided have been reprovided in other venues within the town centre notably prism as such in line with the inspector's recommendations here officers consider that this matter has now been put to bed uh, loss of retail whilst there would be a loss of dedicated retail on eden street uh, there is uh, the, or the development proposal of potential for ancillary residential or retail space uh, rather along Eden Street, depending on the end user. But as we see it designed, the end user will have that ancillary retail space on Eden Street. Now, a key consideration is the uh, a tall building policy within uh, the London Plan Policy D9. Of particular note here is the Policy B9 uh, is uh, Policy D9 Point B3 is clear that tall buildings should only be developed in locations that are identified as suitable in development plans. However, the local plan that we have, the Kingston Core Strategy, lacks the identification of specific areas that are considered suitable for tall buildings, other than by reference to policy CS8, which in itself refers to tall buildings being appropriate in the borough's town centres. However, some parts of these areas will be inappropriate or too sensitive for such buildings. Relevant SPDs will provide further guidance on this matter. It's important to note that the SPD is not policy and as such there is a strict technical conflict with policy D9, not necessarily flowing from the development but flowing from the fact that this council, like many other councils in the capital, has not been able to rewrite tall buildings policies in the last four weeks since the mayor published his London plan. Um, our plan is out of date with his plan uh, because of the passage of time. However, 
whilst there is a conflict with the London plan, the weight we give that conflict is up to the decision maker. And there are considerations which the decision maker must take into account in attributing weight to that conflict. So in officers arriving at that balancing exercise, we've considered that the departure from the guidance in the Eden Quarter Development Brief is justified for the following reasons. As we've already seen, Kingston is identified as an area with opportunity potential for growth, both commercial and residential growth. The site is in a highly sustainable location with excellent links within Kingston and the wider London area. The proposed phase one buildings being organised and articulated in a way that responds to the local context uh, makes it acceptable in officers' opinion. Uh, building A provides a strong frontage to Eden Street and the potential future Eden Square, adhering to the brief in that regard. Other tall buildings uh, are present uh, around the site, including the college building, the multi-storey car park building serving the Crown Courts, the old post office building that's coming out of the ground and its neighbouring uh, shoulders on that building, and the Eden Walk uh, development. These buildings together form a southern gateway into the town, identified in the area action plan as being a, a location for a uh, landmark. The developments offer a series of public realm improvements, the development would uh, capture the modernisation and reinvigoration of an underused central site in Kingston Town Centre. The provision of new purpose-built office space, which maximises opportunities in line with the operator's requirements and brings new employment opportunities, would contribute positively to the vitality and vibrance of the town centre. Any harm to heritage assets has been minimised. The harm to long-term views has been neutralised and mid-range views minimised except with the marketplace in Kingston Old Town Conservation Area as discussed. And the microclimatic conditions have been addressed or have been assessed and mitigated where necessary. Uh, that report, the microclimatic report, has been submitted by the applicant and assessed by independent appointed consultants. Uh, looking now at the two key considerations or uh, key considerations of design, looking at the design review panel, the uh, design review panel were uh, welcome the improvements that had been made through the course of the application. Uh, they we involved the improved accessibility to the Woodland Walk. They talk that the massing and architectural treatment are both acceptable to the panel and that the scheme should be a flagship, flagship for Kingston. They go on to say that the public realm is inadequate and there are issues with the quantum accessibility and environmental quality of the public realm, particularly the Woodland Walk. It's important to note since the DRP, additional microclimatic studies have been undertaken, additional information has been submitted and assessed, and also the scope of public realm works have been widened to include the surrounding streets in response to the concerns raised by the design review panel. Looking at the Greater London Authority, uh, their urban design team uh, say that the proposal seeks to optimise the site and the proposed layout, height and massing is broadly supported. Again, they raise issues with public realm areas and active frontage. In response to that, further information uh, was submitted in, with regards to increasing the scope of public realm areas, but also further information on the active frontage on St. James, how that can be activated with possible video walls, um, advertising. And then we have the urban design comments from Kingston. Uh, I won't read this in full, but again, highlighting that the office buildings and the car park are well arranged, uh, the height and massing uh, beds in acceptably, the comprehensive redevelopment of the combined site is welcome, and the proposal is considered to generally function well and holistically redevelop the existing poor quality outdated urban fabric into a new improved purpose-built office scheme with associated landscaping. Now it's important that we do focus and acknowledge the importance of the heritage assets. Offices have concluded that the proposed development would, taken in combination with other consented developments, result in less than substantial harm to the significance of the marketplace and by connection to the listed and locally listed buildings contained therein and by connection the Old Town Conservation Area, all in terms of their setting. The building doesn't interact physically with any listed structure heritage asset, asset but it does impact on its setting. Officers cognizant of the Court of Appeal decision in Barnwell note that the finding of harm to the setting of a listed building or harm to conservation area, uh, conservation area gives rise to a strong presumption against planning permission being granted. The presumption is a statutory one, it is not irrebuttable and it can be outweighed by material considerations powerful enough to do so. But an authority can only properly strike the balance between harm to heritage assets on the one hand 
and planning benefits on the other if it is conscious of the statutory presumption in favour of preservation, those found in the Planning List of Buildings Conservation Areas Act. The less than substantial harm identified will have to be weighed up against any public benefits associated with the proposal. It's important to note again, less than substantial harm does not equate to less than substantial weight. Weight of a considerable weight and importance uh, would be uh, weighed against the proposal. Looking now at the key considerations for car parking, again it is acknowledged that the proposed replacement of the car parking would be contrary to policy T6 of the London Plan. Uh, T6 of the London Plan says where you are reproviding car park, you should reprovide it in a way which matches up-to-date policy. Uh, there is a slight ambiguity in policy T6 as it talks about car parking in opportunity areas against car parking in outer London areas. Uh, Kingston Council hasn't identified the area that will or would be an opportunity area. However, the London Plan does identify Kingston as a potential opportunity area. Depending on which assessment you use, opportunity area or outer London, the proposal conflicts with policy T6 in a varying degree. However, in relation to this application, there are considerations that need to be taken into account and these include the site already accommodates an existing poor quality car park. The proposed car park would be designed so it could be repurposed in the future for different uses. This has been demonstrated by the applicant that the car park could be put in to a different use uh, and plans have been, indicative plans have been put in demonstrating how that could be achieved. The proposed car park would represent an, arch an architectural or an architecture, it says there, it should be architectural improvement. It would be equipped with 20% active electrical charging provision with 80% passive infrastructure installed so as to future-proof the car park in line with the GLA's um, uh, suggestions. It would be available for the public at weekends in addition. Now at the bottom there we identify that the car park exceeds the maximum standards allowed in the London plan with level of over provision varying depending on whether the site is classed as an opportunity area or not. This conflict weighs against the proposal and that is as set out in the agenda papers. However, the weight attributed to this breach must be assessed in light of the matters highlighted above and officers, officers have done that in their assessment. In conclusion, and if I take you now to the agenda paper with regards to uh, the development, it's important first and foremost that officers well acknowledge that officers conclude that the proposal would cause harm to the settings and therefore the significance of a series of designated heritage assets in Kingston Town Centre. They are the marketplace and the Kingston Old Town Conservation Area. Paragraph 109 of the framework expects that any harm to the significance of a designated heritage asset should require clear and convincing justification. Paragraph 196 of the framework requires that where a development proposal will lead to less than substantial harm, as in this case, that harm should be weighed against the public benefits of the proposal. In terms of the weight to be given to the harm, uh, that is, as I've already set out, less than substantial does not equal uh, less than substantial objection. The agenda report goes on at paragraph 281 to talk about the benefits that would flow from this development. Paragraph 281 sets out, with regards to the benefits, officers attach significant weight to the provision of modern office space, a net increase in terms of office floor, spa floor space on site. Also a significant qualitative improvement on the existing office accommodation. Significant weight is also attributed to the increased direct and indirect employment opportunities the development would have the potential to create. So the 2000 full-time equivalent jobs, although that would be somewhat tempered given existing employment on site at Lever House, but also the, eco the economic or the or rather the financial contributions of the £232,000 to the workplace brokerage scheme, £250,000 to the affordable workspace, the employment skills package that deals with the apprenticeships, the procurement routes and the £50,000 for the implementation of that are all given significant weight. Significant weight is given to the public realm improvements which would, in the opinion of officers, uh, have uh, improvements to the settings of the old post office and United Reform Church by realising the vision of Eden Square and certainly uh, facilitating 
uh, more work at Eden Square to take place. Officers consider that the combination of the public benefits uh, that the application proposal will bring to the borough are sufficient to justify or outweigh the harm to the proposed development or that the, the pro proposed development would cause to the multiple sets which have been identified. Uh, the report also identifies the conflict with the tall buildings London plan policy. It also identifies the conflict uh, with the car parking uh, policies, both of which are accorded uh, weight. It's also acknowledged that the development would cause harm to surrounding existing permitted dwellings, ex permitted, existing, permitted, sorry, permitted and existing dwellings in terms of impact on daylight and sunlight. However, given the guidance uh, from the mayor and the national planning policy framework for such guidance to be to be applied flexibly, that is given the appropriate weight as set out in the report. And then, in conclusion, as you see, at paragraph two hundred and eighty-five. Officers conclude that whilst the development would be contrary to the London plan and would be con would conflict with uh, policies regarding um, uh, impact on residential amenities, you notably know, policy D6, also the policies about parking, uh, that notwithstanding that, overall the proposed development would still accord with the development plan taken as a whole. Section 3866 of the Act talks about the development plan taken as a whole, not just individual policies in the plan. Officers consider that it accords with that policy and as such recommend approval. If I now take you to the late material for uh, 20 slash 029 we've had an additional consultation from the Secretary of State. Uh, he has reserved, received a third party request to call in the application. Uh, he's indicated that uh, he wouldn't necessarily look at such a call in until the stage two process has gone through with the mayor. Uh, so he has requested that before Kingston issues a decision uh, that we uh, touch base with the Secretary of State. The Greater London Authority provided extra comments on the urban greening factor, identifying meeting with those policies, uh, identifying the surface water drainage plan and hydraulic calculations now complies uh, with the relevant information. They also discuss uh, how energy uh, and uh, matters uh, relating to the energy statement and bespoke carbon factors will be picked up at the stage two response and if members were minded to approve will be picked up by condition and discussions with the mayor's team uh, will continue. Uh, the historic royal palaces uh, raise no objection to the proposal. The London Borough of Richmond uh, maintain uh, their objection, they're cognizant of the views of historic England and of uh, the royal palaces but ma maintain their objection nonetheless. Kingston Town Neighbourhood Conservation Area Advisory Committee maintain their objection. The Riverside Residents Association uh, raised an objection on excessive parking, dead frontages and excessive height. The United Reform Church uh, uh, maintain their objection. The application would harm the setting of the listed church, contrary to conclusion of the officer's report. The impact is worse than the appeal scheme, their words, not mine, and contrary to its findings. The Kingston Society, they maintain their objection. We have had 10 additional uh, neighbour objections they are reiterating previous comments and raising additional concerns. One identifies that the site is not in an opportunity area, which identifies that problem that I've highlighted on car parking. If we do take the line that we're not in an opportunity area, the car parking is breached by 10. If we say it is, it's breached by more. Uh, no equalities assessment has been undertaken is a, another re, um, objection by a resident. Officers consider that uh, such a detailed uh, quality assessment is not necessary in this development. Uh, we have had one uh, additional neighbour letter of support. The Kingston Neighbourhood Committee, we're reiterating here the, the points that they raised at their meeting on 21st of January. Since that meeting, the uh, Kingston neighbor, since the meeting of the Kingston Neighbourhood Society, a number of uh, amendments were made, including the uh, public realm improvements to Eden Street, Brook Street and St James Road, the provision of limited access to the private car park at the rooftop gardens, something that was raised at the neighbourhood. Uh, contributions to Kingston Workmatch work match Job Brokerage Scheme and other economic benefits uh, and the financial uh, contribution towards delivery of flexible, affordable workspace and implementation of an employment and skills plan. There are a couple of corrections in the report. Paragraph 47 doesn't refer to the RBK view study report. However, it is important to note that as is set out in, the, in the, T, uh, the Townscape Visual Impact Heritage Assessment, the views in there are a direct consequence of discussions involving the Kingston Key uh, views study. Paragraph 99 should be deleted as it's not relevant. Paragraph 232 uh, should be amended as set out. Paragraph 233, there was an uh, incorrect uh, number there put in for the cycle uh, 
uh, provision. The 466 is the correct figure based on the office floor space. Uh, we have additional conditions, 5455, 54 requiring a retail management plan to be submitted for that ancillary retail provision. Uh, paragraph or condition 50, 54 rather, 55 uh, requiring once the lever house has been demolished, the woodland walk should be made available to members of the public in accordance with hours of access and management plan to be submitted to the council. 56, prior to the commencement of the car park, details should be submitted to demonstrate how the car park could be repurposed. Section 57, or condition 57, uh, details demonstrating the water reharvesting uh, to be submitted. Number 58, how the comprehensive landscaping strategy would achieve the proposed urban greening factor and would be maintain, maintained. Uh, additional section 106, heads of terms, a workplace travel plan to encourage a shift to stone modes of transport, a car park management plan, and taking all those things together, Mr Chairman, the recommendation is prior to the decision being issued, the application should be referred to the Greater London Authority for the stage two response to the Secretary of State at the Ministry of Housing, Communities, Local Government, and that taking into account the environmental information contained within the environmental statement, approved subject to the conditions and the completion of the relevant legal agreement as set out in the officer's report and the agenda papers, and to get delegate to the Assistant Director of Strategic Planning and Infrastructure any consequent changes to conditions and agreement to be agreed in consultation with the Chair of the Development Control Committee. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you very much, Barry. I think we can agree that that was a very comprehensive uh, presentation, um, which gave us a very um, complete overview of the application. Um, I'm going to turn now to uh, Councillor Felchikov Sumner, who wishes to address the committee under procedural rule 27. As usual, Sharon, um, you, uh, you, I'll point out that there is no time limit specified for you to speak. But if you could keep to about five minutes, that would be appreciated, given that that's how long collectively the objectors get and collectively how long the applicants get. So um, it's over, over to you now, Sharon. It's the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. And I, I will be as brief as I can. And thank you for allowing me to speak. And um, I think it's important that, um, that, that someone does speak about this application in a, in a holistic way. For what we, from, if you have a look at all of the objections from a large number of esteemed societies and, and residents, you will see we have an application that everyone apart from, well, King's RBK thinks, believes that this, that this so-called Ebden campus will destroy both heritage assets and our protective views. Now, the scheme also doesn't seem to fit a lot, of, doesn't seem to meet a lot of policies. And, and we all sit through lots of committee meetings with the planning officers telling us that we that something meets it does if it meets the um the GLA policies, and then, then we really have no grounds for refusal. And we're in an unusual situation where you're being asked to permit something that doesn't meet GLA policies and doesn't meet lots of other policies. Um, and yet we are still you're still being asked to permit this. I, I think it's a very dangerous scheme to permit. Um, I think if you have a look, we have a scheme which actually provides, you know, sort of 10% more, sorry, well, 300, what is it, 350 car parking spaces, but just 36 social housing units. So really this scheme puts car parking before it puts social housing. And I don't think we should really be setting that precedent. Councillor Liz Green in a recent meeting of Surbiton Neighbourhood said that her ethos when she ran the council was to turn around to developers and say, if you can't abide by Kingston's policies, then please don't come here and try and build something. And yet again, we'll, we appear to be welcoming a scheme which doesn't meet Kingston's policies. The justification for providing all of these areas of harm and policy um, defects seems to be the economic argument, the policies, that, but I, I would suggest that, that that is full of half truths. We have this figure of 2,000 jobs, which it's going to bring supposedly. And yet Unilever have already said publicly, it's not gonna give any new jobs. It's, it's consolidating jobs from other areas, from other areas in Surrey. So we are going to see 300 people driving from the other areas of London and Surrey into our borough to come to work at this Unilever complex. That is gonna increase the pollution on our roads. It's gonna worsen our air quality. And yet we're still being asked to approve this of the basis of these 350 car parking spaces. We're also told that it's going to bring us great other great economic benefits, but 
to be fair, yes, there will be some increasing jobs and that we should all welcome that. But we should be making the decision, or sorry, you should be making those decisions based on truths and not half truths and overestimations. The policy, just the policy document that's been presented is just contradictory in so many ways. We heard that one of the reasons to override the lack of the um, the harm to the heritage assets was because of, of the building sustainable location, and that was put as one of the reasons for doing that. But if it's in a sustainable location, why do you need 350 car parking spaces? If there is a sustainable travel for this building, why do you need 300 car park, 350 car parking spaces? Everything within that presentation was contradictory, which I accept makes this very, very difficult for you. I would urge you all to think very, very carefully and remember that in it, on the 1st of August, permitted development rights are going to be extended. If a commercial building is left empty for three months, then the owner can then have that converted straight away through permitted development rights into residential. So potentially you're not looking at a scheme that gives you 111 housing units with 36 social housing. You're potentially looking at more buildings than that. All they have to do is make sure the commercial part of the building never opens for three months. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, and, and thank you for being very timely on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we've now, I just want to clarify who we've got as uh, public speakers, uh, registered speakers, both for the objectors and for the applicants. So as I've had a note saying there's a little bit of confusion on that, and I may be turning to Henry uh, Democratic Services Officers just to clarify that. I just, at this moment, I want to clarify that for the, and maybe Henry, you can confirm this. I've got down, speaking for the objectors, we've got Andrea Coates, Robin Caitlin, Toby Hiscock and Keith Payne as objectors. Is that correct, Henry? Uh, I received further confirmation today that it would just be Robin Caitlin and Toby Hiscock tonight, but I don't know if that's any different. So that, uh, they'd like to confirm well, now. I mean, I've included those three, so that's absolutely fine. Yes. Um, and for the objectors, I've got down Sebastian Munden. Sorry, for the objectors, I do apologise for the on behalf of the applicants speaking in support would be Sebastian Munden, Jonathan Laws would be the, their two main speakers, but also registered so that they can ask questions are Chris Darling, Yvette Edwards, Sarah Jackson, Justin Bolton and Barry Kitcherside. Have I got that correct, Henry? And are there any other names that are registered that I should have included? I believe that's that's all I have on, on my records, Chair. If anyone else in the meeting would like to quickly confirm, if if anybody else thinks it's in the meeting thinks that they should have been included in that list, could you just pop your name in the chat function and we'll clarify that with Democratic Services? But there's no names coming up, so it looks like we have got that clarified. So thank you. So that takes us now to the uh, registered. Uh, speakers uh, who are registered objectors and so Andrea, uh, Robin and, and Toby and if Keith if you're present that's fine as well but if it's just the three of you that's fine. Um, you, as you're aware you've got five minutes collectively between you and we'll give you um, a, an indication or Dem Services Officers will give you an indication when there's one minute left to go. So between you, you've got five minutes. How you split the time up is entirely up to you. So it's, it's over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Malcolm. It's Toby Hiscock here, Chair of the Kingston Town uh, Neighbourhood Conservation Area Advisory Committee, or CAC. Uh, evening, everybody. Uh, the CAC doesn't often speak out publicly on planning applications, but occasionally a proposal will come along of such significance for our town that it's in the wider interest for us to do so. This scheme is such a proposal, as was its predecessor in 2018-19, on largely the same site. We've made strong objections to both phases of the scheme. There's no time to go through them all now, but I do want to persuade you that the consequent harm has been understated and the benefits overstated in your officer's report. That these planning applications would cause harm to Kingston's rich heritage is not in dispute. Your officers concede less than substantial harm from each phase under the NPPF and non-compliance with the London plan, 
several of this council's own policies, as well as its Eden Quarter development brief, which is a material consideration. But to recommend, as your officers do, tall buildings on a site which has not been designated as a suitable location in this council's development plan, we believe amounts to a misdirection under policy D9 of the London plan. Officers have also dismissed the Kingston Views Study Report 2018, another material consideration. And for example, they downplay the very highly important view of Guildhall from Barge Walk. But compromising this iconic view, as is the case under phase two of the scheme, would be a severe loss to Kingston residents and visitors alike. We also believe phase two would cause substantial harm to the setting of the ancient marketplace and that the scheme as a whole would breach both existing and proposed planning law. Furthermore, it would ignore the objections and concerns from your neighbouring administration in Richmond, Historic England, Kingston upon Thames Society, United Reform Church and a host of others. Historic England remain troubled, as are we, by the cu cu cumulative impact of this and other consented schemes on Kingston's historic core and their conflict with the Planning Inspectorate's 2019 appeal decision and this council's strong public support of that decision. Would the alleged benefits of the scheme outweigh this harm? Well, be because your officers consider it less than substantial harm, they believe they would, but we strongly disagree and think they've got this balance wrong. Even the scheme's supporters, such as the GLA in its stage one response and design review panel in its December 2020 comments, question the benefit on several fronts and single out the disbenefit of a seven-storey car park, which is a clear breach of London and this council's sustainable transport policy. My colleague will talk more about this in a moment. While the, vari while the various financial and other con contributions from the developer, which are contingent on completion of each phase, are modest and transitory compared to the budget and long-term effects of the scheme, Kingston's historic core is priceless. Given the profound harm which would result from these planning applications, it's incumbent on you to refuse consent and press for a better alternative that is less harmful and outweighed by a public benefit that is, that is substantial and rigorously tested in these very uncertain times. We trust you will reject this scheme tonight. I'll now hand over to Robin Caitlin, who represents the Riverside Residents Association. Robin. I think we can't we can't hear Robin. Can we just it, it shows you as unmuted, Robin, but we can't hear you. Or I can't. I don't think anybody else can. Chair, if it helps, I can read his comments on his behalf. Yeah, I'll give, just give Robin. Can you just try muting and unmuting again, Robin? Uh, Chair, uh, big upon here, Fiona Cotter here from Democratic Services. Uh, Mr. Caitlin, can you con try control, pressing Control D on your keypad, see if that helps? No, I don't think. Uh, is the volume, can you check the volume setting on your device? You're on mute, Chair. I think what we'll have to do, if Toby, if you've got the uh, what, if you've got what Robin was going to say, would you be good enough to continue and read that out? And and a note to our democratic services officers. I know you've got time in the five minutes, but I I trust that you will um, not count the time that we've just spent uh, trying to trying to resolve this. So we will 
to take over for the five minutes will continue from from when um toby finished his his bit as it were Does that makes sense yeah i hope so uh, if you can continue then toby thank you very much okay chairman thanks any new office development in a central activity zone or town center should be car free or in an opportunity area 54 spaces maximum are permitted under policy t6.2 it's agreed that this scheme is an opportunity area, a fact confirmed by both the GLA and the planning officers. Also, it's clearly in a central activity zone or town centre. It's the multi-storey car park which is driving the unacceptable heights and mass of the scheme. If removed, the one minute remaining. If removed, the scheme could be redesigned to remove the harm to heritage and dead frontages and yet still meet Unilever requirements. The de developer has failed to comply with London policy D9 on tall buildings, which requires exploration of less harmful alternatives. Despite obvious less harmful options, including the Bitons car park, they've done nothing. And the reasons given by the planning officers to justify the level of unnecessary harm are weak and subjective, particularly in relation to the car park. Unilever is simply not going to just walk away. They have an onerous 50 year lease uh, on Lever House, which the developer is promising to tear up as part of the deal. Rest assured, if these proposals are rejected, the developer will immediately come back with a policy compliant scheme. To suggest they would walk away is simply bluff. Members must not be bullied into approving this deeply harmful scheme. You have clear grounds to reject both applications, and I urge you to think strategically and deliver a scheme that will protect our heritage assets and build back better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry we had the hiccup, but I think we got there in the end. And we thank you very much for reading out what Robin was going to say. Thank you. Um, we now turn to the uh, applicants. And of course, you've got five minutes collectively between you again. Um, and that's Sebastian and Jonathan, I think, are going to speak. So it's uh, you've, uh, five minutes. It's over to you now. I'm going to give you a, a one minute notice when you've got one minute left. Thank you. Good evening, councillors, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. My name is Jonathan Laws, a director of CUBE, and I'd like to set the scene and provide a brief overview of how we got here tonight. In August 2019, CUBE took over the fund management of the site, and we were not involved in the previous residential application, which was refused at appeal. My first call was to your planning officers, where it became very apparent that there was a desire to see our site developed but a need to encompass the whole island site, including Lever House. That led to my second call, which was to Unilever, who have a 50 year lease on Lever House. Timing is everything as Unilever were evaluating their portfolio due to a desire to relocate from their Leatherhead offices. Once they saw the potential of our site, their initial requirement grew to a 275,000 square foot office campus to enable the consolidation of their offices in Leatherhead, London and Kingston into a single global headquarters. The residential element, which we have reduced in height from 22 to 16 storeys, provides 115 new homes for town centre living, 35% of which is affordable. This is critical to the viability of the development by allowing us to agree the competitive terms to attract Unilever. In summary, we are absolutely delighted that by working in partnership with the Royal Borough, Unilever, local groups and residents, we have been able to deliver a world-class headquarters, 35% affordable homes, and the greening of the town centre. Unilever have been fully committed along the process since undertaking a comprehensive staff consultation, and their support has been crucial to getting to this point. Their desire to remain in Kingston has been evident from the start, and I'd like to now hand you over to Seb Munden, General Manager of Unilever UK and Ireland, to highlight what this opportunity means to Unilever. Thank you, and over to Seb. Thanks, uh, Johnny. Yeah. So hello, everybody. I'm uh, Sebastian Munden. Everyone calls me Seb. Um, I'm the general manager of Unilever in the UK and Ireland. Um, Unilever, as you know, uh, we make the products you'll find in your supermarkets today. Our products are in about 99% of British homes. I personally feel very enthusiastic about bringing such a large part of our UK workforce to Kingston. And I very much hope you'll support the application. I started my career in Lever House. Uh, in 1990, we've occupied that since 1971. We have a good history of long-term occupation and building deep community roots. I used to live in Surbiton. I moved there because of the office 
and love my walk along the river to work. We're very excited. We're bringing 2,000 employees from locations across central London, Leatherhead, and a few here in Kingston, uh, should we get planning permission. They currently live across the southeast of England, from Hertfordshire, across many London boroughs, to Southend, down to Brighton, and out as far as Oxford. Over time, our experience shows that the proportion of people living locally increases, as I did when I began in 1990. We see this as an opportunity to create a vibrant and modern workplace designed for ways of the future in the most sustainable and accessible office we can build and run. And we've invested significant attention to both the base build and the fit up. We know our colleagues will take full advantage of the town as I did when I started, close to consumers and near many of the stores of our key retailers, as well as adding a couple of our own. They'll clearly enjoy frequenting the restaurants, bars, shops, sports and leisure facilities available. But it's not just our own employees, we'll have many visitors, uh, including suppliers, colleagues from abroad, uh, coming and staying in the Kingston area should our application be successful. And we believe that many of them will also take advantage of everything Kingston has to offer. We create over 300 work opportunities in our Southeast sites every year for young people, including our graduate scheme, apprenticeships, industrial placements, and work experience programs, including for diverse uh, uh, candidates who are further from the workplace. Kingston University is all one of our key targets, but I can't tell you how difficult it is to find a, a location big enough for 2,000 people to work together in a modern collaborative way. And therefore, you know, these sites are very, very hard to come by. So I really hope that that combined with the fact that we're long term uh, stayers and that we work with, deeply with the community, that you'll support the CUBE application uh, for planning today. Thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you both very much. And we may be coming back to you for questions in, in a few minutes. Um, but we now turn to questions. If members have got questions for the objectors, if you do, could you just pop your name in the uh, chat function, please? Any questions for the objectors? It looks like there are no questions. Oh, Mark. So I'm going to, we, again, we've got five minutes in total for questions. Um, I'm going to turn first to Councillor Mark Bennion. Over to you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Hiscock, you made it, yeah, your, kind of, um, your comments clear about obviously the objections about the effect on the heritage assets, um, which, yeah, which, which I understand. But just in, in terms of the design of the proposed design, have you seen it um, projected? What do you think about the design of the new buildings, um, the you know, proposed buildings uh, for this site? Um, yeah, in terms of, yeah, what, what are your thoughts uh, in terms of how they will appear just in, the, in their own context, I, well, I guess, rather than the effect they might have on the historic assets? So, th th thank you, Mark. So I think that's a question saying, what do you think of the design um, rather than the impact on the historic, if I've got it right, rather than the impact that they might have on the historic assets in the surrounding area, what do you think of the design per se? Is that what you're asking, Mark? I just want to be clear, so that is thumbs up. So it's over to you. Um, I guess it's either of you, Andrea, Robin or Toby. Well, I'll start if you like, uh, Malcolm. I mean, you know, because in our view, they're excessively tall, um, you know, way beyond the guidance in the uh, Eden Quarter Development Brief and uh, the London Plan. Um, and also um, the massing and scaling uh, and scale involved. Um, we don't like the design at all. Uh, I don't know if Andrew wants to add to that. Or Keith. You've answered the question. Okay. You you can add to it or not as you wish. Is Andrew? Uh, yes, it's, it's Andrew. You're yeah. on. Hi. Hi. I'm up. Can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I, I I think it's a it's a difficult question uh, because these buildings could be plonked anywhere, as far as I can see. They are. Um, uh, they're they're glassy. They're they're um, you know modern. And really, I, I find it quite shocking that, that they're, the planning officers think they're in any way in the context of the historic centre of the town. So the fact they could be uprooted and just put anywhere in any city is, I think, uh, a, a telling uh, comment on the status of those buildings. 
Okay, thank you very much. It appears that we have no other questions, so thank you very much um, to the, I think it's the three of you, so thank you very much for coming this evening. We now have questions or five minutes available for questions of the applicants. Uh, so if any members have que of the committee have questions for the applicants, could you put your name in the chat function, please? And we've got, I've got coming up, I've got councillors Edward Moll and Ryder Mills in that order at the moment. So we start the five minutes when you start asking your question and, and then councillor Dunn, bang it. There's a whole, I've got the list of names, but we're going to start off with councillor Edwards. Thank you. Over to you, Simon. Uh, thank you, Chair. Very brief question, actually. It's uh, why do you need so much parking? Thank you. Straight to the applicants, whoever wishes to answer. Thank you. Well, uh, Should I, I take this one? Yeah, why don't you have a Sorry, go? Back. Um, yes, yeah, so it's a very uh, fair question. Um, I think when we announced our plans, uh, we did our consultation with, with our over 2,000 current employees. And one of the biggest sources of anxiety um, amongst our own people is the distance. For some of them, they will have to travel. And I think, as Seb said, when he set out um, uh, sort of, you know, the, the sort of geographic range of where all of our people live, um, I think one major consideration for us, certainly um, in the short to medium term, is, is a potential massive uh, talent drain if we don't make it easy for people or easier for people to get to the office. And we have a high proportion of parents, we have a high proportion of um, women in particular with childcare considerations. Uh, we have carers um, who uh, I think have expressed really significant anxiety and that's one of the reasons it's such a big issue um, for us and such a, a, a kind of essential part of these plans. Thank, thank you very much. We've got a number of other questions so I'm going to move straight on to Councillor Moore. Rebecca. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, following on with the car parking, I can understand um, why you, you know, to start with, you'd need that. But um, did you explore other parking options in the town centre um, as per what the residents, um, the objectors uh, referred to, um, thereby not putting it on the site in itself? Uh, I'll answer that. Yes, we did explore other options. Um, but we are designing a, an exemplary car park here, which enables Unilever to have their showers and bike storage in the basement and the entertainment space on the roof. It also was a categoric requirement of Unilever to have their car parking on site. Perhaps Yvette, if you want to, to add to that. Well, also, also because we have people uh, coming at different times of the days, then most, you know, we do this flexible working. It's very important that people with caring responsibilities don't have to get there at the crack of dawn in order to get a car parking space. And therefore, you know, we felt that having our own uh, space would allow us uh, to uh, provide that. Also, we believe that given the kind of direction of uh, travel, if that's not an inappropriate word of our uh, transport policy, you know, we really wanted to have a state of art uh, uh, charging facility uh, for electric vehicles. And we didn't see anything in town centre providing us anything like the kind of quantity that we would uh, be envisaging. Okay, thank you for that. I'm going to move on to the next question, which is from Councillor Dave Ryder-Mills. Thank you. Thank you, Malcolm. Um, I will continue with the car parking thing. Um, Yvette mentions the, the number of people who showed, con uh, number of employees that showed concerns. Seb mentioned the, the ambition that employees would be moving towards Kingston over a period of time. Uh, you've got the car park there for quoting Yvette, I hope, uh, short to medium term. What do you mean by short to medium term? Can yeah. you specify it in years? Um, we'll go, we've got a number of questions waiting, so I go straight to so, um, No, I, I, I'm really sorry. I don't think we can. Um, I think uh, what we obviously don't want to do is lose a lot of talent. I think when Seb um, was talking earlier, I mean, obviously our, our population does change over time, but it's really difficult at this stage to, um, to speculate about when and what that might look like. 
the council of Ryder Clark, Ryder Mills, this is going to also be a public car park. This is a replacement of an existing car park in the overall scheme of things with a slight reduction. And a significant uh, upgrade. Oh, the traffic movement is, mo is less than it would be at this moment in, moment in time. Um, to put this in, in, in context. It's okay. a replacement of car parking space. Thank you, thank you. We've got the answer to that. I think. Thank you very much. Uh, the last question I've got you. You might just have time. Is is Councillor Steph Archer? Hello. Um, just on car parking again. Are you going to provide any incentive to your employees to get electric vehicles? And is there any way of also increasing the amount of electric vehicle provision charging points in the car park? Yeah, great question. I think that the point about the electric vehicles charging is that on rapid charge, uh, we could change vehicles around and that would obviously reduce the energy load in total. I, I think we could uh, blow a gasket or whatever the technical term is if we put charging everywhere. But it, it is our um, sincere aim to, to drive vehicles. Okay, thank you very much. And that is the five minutes app, which we just managed to get all the questions in and the answers. I think we got your answer there, Sid. So thank you. Um, I'm now going to go back to our planning officer, Barry uh, Lomax, to uh, sweep up and come back with any points that he wishes to, following the contributions that we've just had from Councillor um, Fouchikov Sumner and from the objectors and the applicants. So I'll go back to you, Barry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a, a couple of points to come back on, and then we'll take any questions that anybody might have. So the first point is a few people have, have identified conflicts with policy. Now, those conflicts with policy are found in our report. We acknowledge that there are conflicts. However, what is paramount importance is applications are determined in accordance with the development plan taken as a whole. It is not unusual for different policies within the same plan to pull in different directions. It is the job of this committee to balance out that pulling in different directions exercise. And we, it's my job to help you in that endeavor. And my report sets out the policies which are pulling in one direction and the weight I, I, I suggest should be given to those and the benefit pulling in the other direction and the policy compliance and the weight I suspect or suggest should be given to those and then arrive at an overall balance. So because something might fail a single policy in a plan does not equal a scheme to be refused. Officers consider on balance and overall the proposal is in accordance with the development plan. Um, the bit on car parking at the end, uh, um, uh, Mr. Munden was talking about, uh, there, there would be a requirement for a car park management plan and a travel plan. That car park management plan and travel plan would place an obligation on the end user to report back to the council how they are encouraging a modal shift in transport, encouraging people to use sustainable me measures of transport. If uh, that reporting back identifies an increase in sustainable transport in this regard, electrical charging or vehicles requiring electrical charging, we would expect them to uh, provide more charging on site. So there would be a monitoring and management regime similar to like we have or would have at uh, the little headquarters at the top uh, in Tolworth, a, a, a requirement to encourage that modal shift to other forms of transport. Again, it's just important to acknowledge officers identify clearly in the report the car parking would be contrary to policy. But when members come to attribute weight to that conflict, they have to take into account the material considerations that go with it. Uh, one of the main ones is uh, it's not beyond um, uh, uh, on possibility that the developer comes back and develops around the existing car park, keeps the existing car park and develops around it. So we don't necessarily lose the car park. We keep an underperforming architecturally injurious car park and development takes place around it. Uh, this scheme has, has taken the opportunity to improve the architectural impact of the car park to future proof it and for it to be a more sustainable solution. Uh, talk has been made of alternative solutions elsewhere in the town. Unfortunately, uh, this committee isn't here to look at alternatives in terms of in terms of parking in other car parks. That is not in the gift of this committee. It's not in the gift of this committee to allow parking in other parts of the town or indeed whether parking is available elsewhere in town. We are here in charge to deal with the application which is presented in front of us. 
Uh, finally, uh, a point was made by um, a councillor, Fadjikov, that, that this scheme harms protected views. Uh, for the reasons set out in my presentation, officers consider it doesn't. Uh, the scheme has been designed so as to neutralise impact on long views and to minimise impact on mid-range views. We've identified the views that we think are harmed, uh, the view across the barred walk to the, to the guild hall and views out to the marketplace and then we set out in quite a lot of detail how those are weighed against public benefits but never shying away against the weight you need to attribute to that as set out by the courts uh, thank you mr chairman ready to take any questions Thank you very much, uh, Barry. Um, I, I, I should have said that um, for, for all the uh, registered speakers, uh, normally at this point we would say you, we'd ask you to leave the meeting. But as you know, we've got the obviously the phase two part coming up, the outline application, and I think we've got all the same registered speakers. So you're welcome to stay in the meeting. Just I, I'd be grateful if you could uh, make sure your what is it, your camera and microphones are turned off, please. In the meantime, I think that would be the thing to do. Yeah, if you if you could just turn your cameras and microphones off, but you're welcome to stay in the meeting with that proviso. Thank you. We now turn to questions from the committee to officers. This is for questions. This is not for comments. This is for questions of clarity. Now we've had a long presentation so hopefully we've all understood the application but there may be questions of clarity still so if you do could you indicate please and it looks like we've got uh i'm gonna questions i've got the names coming up i'm gonna start with councillor banyan over to you mark thank you thank you chair um a question yeah for barry um just in terms of um you know the the conflicting i guess policy guidances if you can just um for clarity, you can go over the, I think it's point D9 in the London plan, where that's, that's it has, so, you know, it says states, states about the tall buildings, and you said there's, but that goes against potentially the overall thrust of the London plan. And can you just could explain a bit more detail um, what it says and what, what the kind of what else the, the report says that maybe goes against that and how we, how, and so a bit of guidance of how best to kind of weigh that up ourselves, please, if that's okay. Thank you, Barry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so, uh, as we said, uh, so not against the thrust of the whole plan, just the individual policy in the London plan with respect to tall buildings. It is a new policy. It is there adopted or published as of the 3rd of March. Now, that policy places an obligation on a local authority to carry out uh, a process which in its new local plan, Kingston in this case, to identify places on a plan proposal map suitable for tall buildings, to identify what a tall building is, define a tall building, and then uh, to to put that on his proposal map, as I said. Now, because we are only four weeks away from when the mayor published his plan, we absolutely do not have that level of detail on the proposals map or in our development plan. As such, our plan is in conflict with the mayor's plan in this regard. Therefore, we can never be in accordance with it. Uh, members might have seen the Greater London Authority's response to the proposed development of Tolworth Tower. The mayor's identified there. There's a conflict with D9 policy because Kingston doesn't have a specific tall buildings policy. Uh, we're seeing it and we will see it in other schemes coming up around the borough of anything taller than six storeys is classed as a tall building. And the mayor will be saying because Kingston doesn't have on its proposals map, like many other boroughs in the capital, areas clearly identified for tall buildings, there is an automatic conflict with the policy. Now, what the mayor does say when he comments on this, he says, yes, or vicariously through his officers, is there may be a conflict, but you have to take into account other considerations that would then direct the weight you give to the conflict. What are those other considerations? The context in which the site sits, what's around the site, where is it, how sustainable is it in terms of its potential for growth as identified in the London plan? You would take all those things into account and then you'd acknowledge the conflict and then decide how much weight to give it. In this instance, when I spoke about conflict, internal conflict with policies, we have one policy saying you must identify tall buildings. We then have another conflict that says, or another policy saying you must deliver homes. At the moment, those two policies are pointing in slightly different directions. One is saying you can't build a tall building unless you've gone through this work, which we haven't because of time. This policy is saying get, it, get on and deliver housing, optimise sites, and meet your five-year housing land target. Our job is to reconcile those two things. And in reconciling it, we have to take into account those considerations. So officers acknowledge the breach, 
However, officers further acknowledge there are considerations which would minimise that conflict to such an extent that when that conflict is added to other areas of conflict, again, that's gone through consideration exercise, we consider that they are outweighed and the whole scheme as a, to as a total uh, ent entity, phase one, is in accordance with the development plan. I hope I have provided some guidance and not made things infinitely more complicated. Thank you, Councillor. I think it was. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Councillor Rebecca Mole, you've got a question. Thanks. Sir. I've got a few questions. Shall I ask them all this time? Uh, it, uh, yes, please. For expediency, that would be the same. Do I think? Thank you. Brilliant. So to start with it, some clarification on the Eden Court development brief as guidance, not policy, because obviously this um, is six to 12 stories for this application rather than one to eight. And um, I think many objectors and myself are confused therefore about what the policy does guide if it's not what it says within it so if you could explain that further if that makes sense and then also link with that with the eden court development brief with eden square the widening of the pavement wasn't really the vision that i remember at the time i was wondering if you could explain more about how that policy that was a a big benefit for the public realm with all this development has now been um, not met in its entirety. Do you want to answer them or shall I ask all of mine, Barry? What's easiest for you? Uh, if we can pick the, if I tackle these two first and That's then fine. Uh, maybe uh, slightly more. So uh, first and foremost, the Eden Quarter Development Brief, which appears that the guidance is only honoured in the breach of the policy or the guidance, not in its actual adherence. However, it's very important to acknowledge a supplementary planning document is not part of the development plan. It cannot set policy. Policies can only be found in development plan documents, the development plan. What we have in the Eden Quarter Development Brief is guidance in how schemes might come forward. And if they do come forward, how the council would like to see them come forward, but in full knowledge that they are to be applied flexibly, which the council did in its interpretation and application of the brief on Eden Walk, where you see buildings of 14 storeys in areas identified six to nine, and again with the old post office. So the Eden Quarter Development Brief is not policy. It is guidance. It guides development in a direction. However, it does not prevent different schemes coming forward. And our job is to apply the policies in the London Plan, uh, the core strategy against uh, the proposal. It is an important document and the breach is a consideration and that's something that members have to weigh in the balance but there are considerations that we identify in the report that warrant the breach in this regard looking at eden square now eden square doesn't set out in any great detail uh, how a building far it should be stepped back um, i had the pleasure of representing the authority at the public inquiry two years ago on this site and we were successful we spent a lot of time arguing about Eden Square and describing what we thought Eden Square was trying to achieve because the document doesn't necessarily explain in great detail what Eden Square is. You see the schematic drawing I have. Now, from that, we can see a building, um, and it does talk about a building stepping back from the old post office so as to uh, improve the setting of the post office. This building does do that, and that view I showed showed the building re relieving or adding breathing space around the old post office. It does talk about a more generous pavement, but doesn't say how generous. This scheme does uh, secure a generous pavement. I think it's about 4.6 metres in in depth. And then it steps up into that retail court, uh, court, quarter, re not quarter, retail floor, accessing the entire re retail space. It also looks at raising the pavement or the carriageway and repaving across. So this scheme is obliged to make a contribution to the square it's not this scheme's role to deliver a square that is for all those sites in that area to work together coordinated by the council to bring the square on board and this is part of the jigsaw puzzle we have the open space around the old post office that when that uh, opens that will be a very important part of the eden square jigsaw puzzle when eden walk comes on stream the activity at the ground floor retail units the repaving of that area, the opening up by United Reformed Church, Church would play or add that piece to the jigsaw puzzle. And then this scheme, by the stepping back, the repaving, the, the more generous uh, pavement 
would add its piece to the jigsaw puzzle. And then there are further endeavours the council must uh, embark upon, looking at how buses may be rerouted in the town so as to make it a pedestrianised area. They're things that the council might want to look at in the future. I'm not suggesting that would happen as a result of this scheme, because it would be rather a complicated mission. But they are things that the council might look at when we start having this shared space. I hope that answers the question. Thank, th thank you, Barry. And I think, Rebecca, did you have further questions? Yeah, I do. Um, so one, of, one of them is just what, how we consider Unilever HQ moving here as a material pl planning consideration, considering it's not part of the the di direct part of the application. Um, I'm going to give you a few because they're a bit shorter. And then the glazing, can you just talk to me about the environmental efficiency of that or not, if that's a concern? Um, and actually, that's it, just those two. Thank you. On the, on the, on the Unilever, we're going to determine this application for office space. And we know that Unilever are likely to be the occupants. But that's not but that's not what we're approving. Barry will expand on that, I'm sure. Uh, thank you, Barry. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. So, um, Mr Chairman is correct. This application is for Grade A office accommodation of uh, the uh, net internal space as, pro as provided in the presentation. Uh, we understand that Unilever will be moving into it. We understand that they have signed agreements outside of the planning process. However, they are not for consideration here this evening. We are considering two office buildings a car park that could be any end user but what we do know by using the um, homes communities agency's density guidance is that floor space equates to a potential for 2,000 jobs we know that uh, the end user will be obliged to make the contribution to the work match to make the contribution to the affordable workspace to sign a legal agreement for the employment skills work package that is not linked to unity but that is linked to the end user so everything that we have secured or would secure in the event that permission is granted the upgrading to the public realm works they are all the de the, the development will deliver not to the occupier it may be that the occupier who comes on board ends up delivering them, but it's any occupier of this office will be bound by those obligations. They'll be bound by the obligations for encouraging driving modal shifts from cars to public transport or to electric vehicles. They will be charged with driving up electrical charging facilities in the car park. That won't be Unilever charged with that. It will be the end user. So we're conscious that it's very important that this is an office accommodation with capacity to employ 2000 people the future occupiers would be bound by the legal agreement requirements and we see um, that not being a disbenefit that it's a, an, an um, anonymous end user uh, that's not a disbenefit or a benefit the, the benefits as we set out all carry the same amount of weight uh, looking at glazing um, i'm afraid this is definitely something that falls outside of my area of expertise what i do know is that the energy assessment that's been submitted does require carbon savings in terms of the building fabric so that would have gone through the energy assessment to ensure that the building fabric works in an environmentally sustainable way there are also building regulations requirements for the uh, values of the glazing to be of a certain uh, standard but certainly the energy assessment which as we set out in the late paper will be continued in discussions at the stage two process with the mayor would pick that up. I hope I've covered everything. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you very much. The next question is from Councillor David Cunningham. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, I've got three questions. Um, let me uh, put them in order. First of all, um, you mentioned in your presentation uh, regarding harm, and I think you also uh clarified it on section 279 of the agenda regarding the designated heritage set, uh, assets and how you worded in the agenda was quite significant it said harm to each would be less than substantive or substantive substantive now you say the harm to each now if we assume for a moment that you're correct that the harm to each would be less what is the cumulative effect because there are a number of various uh, 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 properties that we're talking about and therefore uh, uh, the way you worded it 
led me to believe that you would also need to clarify what the cumulative effect would be. So that would be my first question. My second question is a follow-on from Councillor Moles uh, regarding uh, Eden Square. And I think I can talk with a little bit of confidence in this because I was chairman of the committee that pushed uh, the SPD through uh, uh, on the Eden Quarter uh, development brief. And that required me to read thousands of responses uh, from the residents. And I think it's fair to say that their interpretation of a square was not just a minor widening of the road, it was a more substantive open, opening. Now, I do take on point uh, that an SPD is a uh, for guidance as opposed to a policy item. But it does seem to me uh, that uh, uh, by merely bending the elevation round, this isn't really giving it the square as I would define it, uh, I would describe that. So my second, my question on that is, would you agree that in fact, uh, bearing in mind some of the illustrated drawings that were included in the SPD, this does not comply with the guidance that was given on the SPD? That'd be my second question. The third question is one I picked up from when you were talking about affordable housing. And while I understand that we're, that's a second application, it's relevant to this one because uh, the percentage of affordable housing, although we're never happy because we want 50%, it's actually in this case uh, as good as we're likely to get or as good as we have got elsewhere, especially as a, a 20 of them are, are social housing. But I think you did say something that when the uh, uh, application came through for uh, the residential block, uh, as and then, um, a revised calculation would be carried out on affordable housing. Did I understand you correctly on that? Or can we, if we were to approve it, insist that we got that same quantum of affordable housing? Because I'd be very concerned that we are making projections on having uh, a residential development and as the applicants have already said the reason for having the residential there is to fund the rest of the scheme and I would be somewhat unhappy if we were saying uh, that uh, uh, they could then renegotiate the situation when it came to a full application. So those are my three questions at the moment uh, perhaps uh, if you want some clarification. Thank, thank you, David. Um, we've got cumulative effect on heritage assets. Uh, Eden called the development brief, the Eden Square issue. Uh, is that being properly addressed? And the affordable housing issue, which I was, I was almost going to interrupt and say, well, this is part of this. This is for the second application. But I take your point, David. I suppose you're saying uh, the two are the two applications are linked, I suppose, in some way. But I'll leave Barry to pick the bones out of that. Thank you, Barry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I uh, start with the third and work backwards, the affordable housing, uh, what I'm, I'm going to have to say to members is they are not to attribute any weight to delivering affordable housing when we deal with this full application. I'm still going to answer the question, but when it's not a benefit of the commercial. However, in direct response to the question, um, because it's an outline application for up to 115 units, we can't secure the quantum in terms of 35% inhabitable rooms of 115, because it might, I have no doubt it won't, but it might come down. They might build 90, they might build 100. They won't. They may not build 115, that would be for reserve matters. But what would be captured in the legal agreement is a requirement for 35% of the habitable rooms to be affordable on the same basis split as we see the social rent and the shared ownership as we see at the moment. So the percentages would be fixed and then they would drive the outcome for the actual quantum at the end, because that would be directly linked to the overall quantum of development. So percentages would be fixed in that legal agreement. Um, if I now jump actually to number one, community of impact, and um, to confirm, and um, I, I um, was uh, had a discussion with you earlier in the week about other things, and this issue cropped up about community of impacts, and I might have uh, misspoke at our meeting. Uh, looking through the paperwork and reading it, in, the 
vi the tan Tanscape Visual Impact Heritage Assessment is clear. It assesses the cumulative impact on all of you. And then for you will note that my presentation does talk of that this development will, in combination with other developments in the marketplace, have an injurious impact on that heritage asset. So this and the, the or post office and the uh, Eden Walk. However, there are elements where they overlap. The old post office will be masked by this development. So then arguably the harm that that development was attributing is now neutralized by this development taking over it. So there's not a necessarily an in combination effect there. One cancels out the other, but you are quite right. When you're walking through the marketplace and you see the Eden Walk development, and then you see this development in combination, we conclude there is an impact which is less less than substantial. Unfortunately, the, the video shows Eden Walk as a bright yellow uh, blob, block, which of course it wouldn't be. So it would not be so readily apparent uh, when it's built. But there is an in combination cumulative impact assessment. Um, if I now look at Eden Square, and rather fortuitously, when we had the public inquiry last time, we actually played to the public inquiry your contribution to the uh, planning committee uh, three or two years ago, Councillor Cunningham. So, yes. Um, we, we heard your, your background at the committee and then again at the public inquiry, which helped the inspector arrive at his conclusion. What we see here is the two key images about Eden Square on the bottom left and the bottom right. Now, we had great problems at the inquiry because these are schematic plans. They are not to scale. If this building seems to appear to be in line with the building at Bath Passage and the building of the post office. Uh, this development is, is mostly, bearing in mind it, it, it bends in, in line with the edge of the post office and the line with the edge of this building. It appears to be in accordance with the brief. However, uh, we don't, this measurement is, is quiet. It's not a scale plan. So the, the building uh, does provide, as we see, uh, increased space. And then we see this artist's impression, which is then rather confusing because we have a square which still has a pavement and a road. So it's not necessarily a shared square. So I suppose in short, what I'm saying is that the aspirations for a public, a, a public space the uh, that appears, well, I'm going to say, appears square-like in terms of being able to use it as one might use uh, a square like the market square, that area in front of this building cannot be that whilst buses travel across it, of course. So what this scheme does is contributes towards what might be an Eaton Square of the future if buses were redirected or traffic was prevented or if it reduced to a single lane traffic. The city of Chester has buses through an area that's um, traffic, uh, bus traffic, but single um, surfacing and build outs and whatnot. That could be achieved here. And that could go some way to making the square. One thing that this scheme does that the other scheme didn't, the one that was refused at public inquiry, that scheme prejudiced the ability of the square to come forward. It did not give any land. It did not do any public realm improvements. It washed its hands of the obligations to make a contribution. This scheme uh, does to the contrary and does make those contributions. But it will be for members um, to decide whether this meets the spirit of the policy in terms of providing the space for an Eden Square public realm. Uh, so community of impact, yes, there was uh, taken into account affordable housing. Yes, that would be captured in the legal agreement. And in, in my humble opinion, yes, the Eden Square is honoured. But of course, that will be for members. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank, thank you very much. Um, and we go on to a question from Councillor Dave ryder -Mills. Thank you. Two very specific questions, one of which is better put um, to the developer, but we ran out of time. Um, you mentioned two Class A trees that uh, officers are saying they do not agree with them being uh, coming down. Um, I'm imagining that you are counting conditions 41 and 42 as securing those uh, is that right and is that um, safe enough to make sure that they do not come down? Uh, the second question is the rooftop access to the public by invitation. 
Now, we have one area that we've struggled for years in trying to get public access to, and that's the undercroft. And it's come down to, to once a year that the public gets access. Um, and it's taken us until now to, to actually make progress on that. I would hate to see this as a once per year. Uh, what is your vision of how many times or how frequently the public will get access to the rooftop? Thank you, Dave. I, think, I thought on the second point, it's in. It says it's got. To, it's got to be uh, made available twelve times a year, but or maybe it's up to twelve. But maybe I read it wrong. Barry, thank you. Thank you. My mind has gone completely blank. Uh, the trees. Sorry, the uh, category. H, sorry, um, it's the late hour. The the conditions 4041 would provide that protection because no tree shall be removed and they are our trees they are street trees so they would have extra protection however uh i'm you know quite happy we do not want those trees to go we do not agree those trees should go we think those trees should stay they're category a trees they're london plain trees they're very handsome trees they are important trees conditions 1441 about trees does provide that protection but we can look at strengthening it if members are concerned to to make it explicit um, notwithstanding submitted information, no tree, in particular the two category A London play trees as identified in the Alpha Cultural Assessment, shall not be removed or shall not be removed full stop and no other tree shall be removed until the requirements of condition 40, 41 have been met. So certainly that can be accommodated. With regards to access to the car park, that is uh, 12 times a year. Uh, however, uh, I have uh, no doubt, 12 is in the agreement, but the end user, if it is Unilever, I'm sure they will be willing to to work with the council to facilitate greater access. You know, the end of the carnival may be taking place in the rooftop or other type of events taking place. It's looking more as submitted as public access for an event for some type of purpose as opposed to just wandering up there to look at the view. Because if we do have 12 times, you know, we wouldn't want to use them and just people popping up and, and looking at the view we'd want to get the most out of those so that use agreement would be drawn up with the end user minimum 12 times a year but it could be more and we could certainly work through this committee the chair to open that up to have the widest possible benefits as as, as we can achieve i hope that answers the questions councillor Ryder mills thank you mr chairman thank you thank you very much and uh last question we're going to take is from councillor ian george thank you Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm talking about the, uh, the, like the very important view of the Guildhall, um, the important historical building from Clatton Bridge, I think it was, the, you know, I think a bridge from the 1100s. Um, with the council seeking to repurpose the Guildhall in future, so it would no longer necessarily be office space, I mean, there, there is, a, to me, there's a good chance that whoever takes it over, it's going to be very expensive to change a listed building to repurpose it. So if it were to be uneconomical un un to repurpose the Guildhall in the future, and it were to sit empty for a long time, could perhaps the devalued historical setting and the views because of this application of tall buildings and that modern block architecture behind it now, make it easier for developers to argue that protection it currently has as a listed historical building um, should be diminished to allow sort of major changes, including perhaps even demolishing or, you know, an unused, uneconomical building. Um, and perhaps some comments on the potential future effects on the protection of other important historical buildings by what could be seen as a gradual ongoing degrading of their importance of, you know, views and settings. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Ian. Um, I'll go straight to Barry as the time's pressing on, but thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. So, in short, no. The Guildhall, which I'm looking over now, although it's slightly dark so I can't see it, um, there's no lights on over there, is a building for its civic importance, its architectural uh, merit, its communal value. None of those things change. Its grading will not alter. It serves its value is in the building's architecture, in the building setting, yes. But more importantly, we consider that the proposal in front of us has been designed in a way which doesn't harm that setting in any event. So um, your 
uh, question is almost leading me to agree that there is harm to the setting, which uh, I, I, I wouldn't agree. I'd say it doesn't harm the setting. And therefore, it is not, in my opinion, going to question or doubt the value and the grading that that building will enjoy for very many years to come and also for the marketplace. Because, again, the marketplace will change. There will be layers of change laid over the historic fabric of Kingston. Kingston is not a place that will be pickled in aspect at a certain point in time and nothing ever happens. Kingston will will change and it's how we manage and monitor that change and make sure it's delivered in uh, in the best way. And we think this scheme strikes the right balance. But in direct answer to your question, no, this, in my opinion, would not in any way question the grading of the Guildhall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you very much. Um, we now turn to debate and and we will go on to a vote. Um, does any member wish to contribute or any comments? This is not particularly questions, but any comments or thoughts on this? Um, if you do, put your name in the chat function. I've got Rebecca first. Let's just see what and the names come up, Rebecca and then Dave. So straight to Councillor Moll. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks, Chair. Um, uh, so my ramblings. I think I, I think it's a really tough application because there's, well, because of everything that we've seen, there's massive pos positives and there are uh, big negatives. So, um, the economic diversification and stimulation to the town is amazing. It's the, you know, the future of town centres is to diversify and this would be a massive contribution to that. And not least, given the past year and the economic situation we're in, um, you know, that is, a, it's, it's a massive, um, a massive uh, positive. Um, and I think that, um, you know, asking the question about how we consider who's going into there was um has influenced the weighting that i give to that in terms of the consideration of how it's how it's used um i think that um one of the things that frustrates me is the sustainability of the site um is what leads it to having high identification that's not what frustrates me sorry but then having the car park as well in the sustainable site and then still being so dense and so tall I really struggle with that. You know, for, for me, densification in town centres due to sustainability means that you are policy compliant. And um, I know that we heard from Unilever why they needed to do it. Yet again, we're not considering Unilever as the applicant because they're not. And so it, it, there's all these things. Um, I struggle with the um, the Eden Square because it's not what we pictured, I think that it's not, um, it's another area that um, causes me concern. Um, the impact on heritage, I do think that whilst it is not the first that has been approved that impacts in some way on, on all these different sites, it is a different position, it is nearer to the ancient uh, marketplace, um, it is nearer to um all saints it is nearer to Clanton bridge and the guild hall those things concern me i personally like the design i think it you know it, it, it's hard with design because it's subjective it, it i prefer i prefer the, the the softness of it and the curvature and the way that it 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 does blend in but um it for for me it, it that doesn't it is better than what we have seen previously rather than good for the heritage assets that we see around the town centre and um, so i'm i'm struggling with it because i i on the scale um it's not convincing me despite the fact that the, that i really want the town centre to be supported um they're my thoughts thank you chair you're on mute Sorry, I was, I yeah, I did it the wrong way. Sorry, thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. And I'll go straight to Councillor Ryder Mills. Thank you. Um, similar in a way to, to, to Rebecca, she's the ward councillor. I'm the neighbourhood chair. Um, I'll be blunt as the neighbourhood chair. It sometimes scares me stiff 
as to the recovery that the town centre needs, uh, given its former reliance on retail, which will probably never return. Uh, we need in the balance, okay, there are negatives, there are huge negatives to this, this application, but there are even larger potential positives. 2,000 jobs, whether they're from the the end user that we've spoken about or, or uh, another end user in the, at the end of the day. Um, but it's highly likely that this first rate office space will be attractive to a developer, uh, sorry, to a, a, a user to bring those 2,000 jobs into the town centre, 2,000 lunches, 2,000 potential shoppers. Um, I think it's a major piece in the recovery of the town centre and quite obviously so do Kingston First and so does Kingston University. Thank you. Thank you Dave. Um, I'll go straight to Councillor Simon Edwards. Thank you. Um, thank you Chair. Um, uh, one, one very technical point about tall buildings. Um, there is obviously a, a a breach of the new London plan that uh, says that tall buildings should only be developed in locations that are identified in, in a, as suitable in development plan because we we haven't identified any such locations in our development plan because we haven't had the time to do it. So I think that's a technical breach only. Um, notwithstanding that, um, clearly um, the heights in the guidance in the uh, Eden Quarter SPD um, uh, are lower than this, but um, it's been explained to us quite clearly that that is guidance only. It's a material co consideration, but it's not policy. Um, and um, we, we've seen that that guidance has been uh, um, overruled. Uh, in in relation to the old post office and, and indeed even more um, for various different reasons. Um, as regards heritage, um, I, I was troubled by the Clapham Bridge view, um, but um, uh, uh, seeing the visuals and the explanation from Barry earlier, I I, I agree that, that 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 view is not harmed, and the setting of the Guild Hall itself is not harmed. It's quite clear, however, as we all have to accept that there's harm, less than substantial harm, to the um, setting of the marketplace. And, and so the real question is, is there, is there something really clear which overrides that? Because it is a it is an extremely important asset. And um, I, I think for for the reasons which were so eloquently put by Councillor Wright Mills, um, I think there is. Um, so I will be, um, after a, a long period of very difficult deliberation, supporting this. Uh, thank you, Simon. We don't have anybody else wishing to speak unless they want to come they've just come in but just at the last moment there uh, uh councillor david cunningham thank you thank you um yeah i mean i'm, I'm disappointed that, that, that i think it hasn't followed uh, the spd um however um uh, we did make the wrong assumptions in the spd the spd uh was on the basis that we would extend the retail element of Kingston down, if not exactly as far as, but at least towards the relief road. It was felt at the time that having a large retail element there, even an anchor store, would be the sort of thing that Kingston wanted uh, and it, an enhancement of its retail element. And I'm afraid, mostly because of what's happened in the last year, I think that's no longer the situation i think that kingston still is an excellent retail area but i think it will have to consolidate uh, uh, and uh, uh, the original proposal on the spd i think is now 
not the way that the not only would the council not want to go down that way but i don't think that the market would want to go down that way so i think the uh, i think you've got to uh, balance it against that yes i'm unhappy about as all the other members have said about uh, the clash uh, with the uh, uh, various uh, other areas in kingston but as everybody else has said you have to balance that against what it's going to bring to kingston and to bring a uh, company <coughs> to bring <coughs> a company into kingston is going to make a big difference for years kingston has always decried the fact that it never had grade a office accommodation it has always been our problem for years and years that the condition of our office stock was such that it could never attract large corporate users into Kingston. The use of this will do that. Now, I would hope that Unilever will be the occupant. It's hard to believe that they would develop it unless they wanted a purpose-built development. Uh, uh, however, um, I think the thought of getting grade A offices in those uh, in this extent it balances against some of the quite uh, significant defects which the officers have put in their report and i've got to say something about the report i think the the report was, was very clear uh, i think uh, it, it didn't uh, hide behind the difficulties that are involved there and it made it easier for me uh, uh, <coughs> as a councillor <coughs> to understand uh, the issues further so uh, regretfully because i would have liked to have seen what was in the spd because i believe very much uh, in it and, and i think that would have been an excellent way forward uh, i've got to say that i probably agree with what the previous speakers have said uh, that the weight of having this this uh, office development in in kingston is really something that we would very much want thank you thank you thank you very much for that david thank you um i've got to to, to speak i've got councillor ian george then councillor mark banyan i'm looking at the time this is a very important large application so i don't want to stop anybody speaking but i'm going to call time to speakers after mark unless you'd have to be very quick off the mark now to put your name in so i think we'll we'll, we'll have ian and then mark and then we will be going i will say a very short step and then we'll be going to a vote but before that Councillor Ian George, please. Thank you very much. I'm going to be very quick. Um, I, I, and I certainly don't underestimate the uh, economic benefits that this uh, could bring, and which will be substantial. And I, you know, I, I think to argue against that would be silly. In, in many ways, I, I, I suspect we're the envy of a lot of other places in having large companies um, wanting to, to invest in our town, um, especially at this time. The design is an improvement on the previous one in most respects. I don't think it's better everywhere. I think there's a it, it does come across as a, a big slice of wall um, at the moment, um, which I'm not particularly keen on. Um, the effects it has on, on the listed buildings and, and, and the general feel of the town uh, it, it is really worrying. And I think that the height and just the bulkiness, I, I don't think I don't think it's good enough, quite frankly. I think they could have done better um, and achieved the same thing or very similar. Um, and quite frankly, I think they should do better. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it as that. They should, they should have done better, I think. Thank you. OK, thank you, Ian. Uh, finally, Mark. Mark Benjamin, thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'll be brief as well, uh, given the time. Best wanted to comment because, it is, yeah, as you say, a big, uh, very big, important application. Um, 
so yeah, I, I, overall, I will be uh, Chase, yeah, supporting this application. Um, I think, yeah, just to echo what what everyone said about the benefits for Kingston as a whole. And I just like to say something about. I appreciate a lot of objections, are particularly around the size, the bulk, and the effect on the heritage assets. But I think it's important to say that yes, that, that they were explained very clearly. Thank you, Barry, for the report, and everyone else who put that together uh, in kind of clearly detailing and going into a lot of detail about all the different you know views and the, and the fact that it would there would be less than substantial. Um, harm uh, to the heritage assets, but um, I think I, I quite like the design. I say that, that you know that, that a good town can have a mixture of old and new um, buildings, uh, and this is I think in a location in Kingston, um, which you know I think they've mentioned it's good for kind of a signpost building or something similar like that. But I can understand this is not a bad place to have a kind of higher uh, yeah, the buildings as we've already got the two other applications going through um buildings that are you know taller than others um so and, and i think it's going to be substantially the main thing for me is going to be a substantial improvement to what's there at the moment it's is it's, it's pretty ugly at the moment where around brook street and, and you know sorry house and this could make a big difference particularly if the kind of um the square idea does take off i think that's something that the council should encourage so th it is just to make the point that you know the, there's the disbenefits to potentially the heritage assets but i think it could be a bonus in terms of improvement of what's there now and can contribute to the um uh the, yeah the, the kind of feel and um uh yeah the kind of creative spirit hub of of kingston and also visually it can be a positive i i i hope as well and um, that's it uh chair thank you thank thank you very much um it is a large application it's a very important application and there are clearly disbenefits and there are to clearly benefits i think i think we've all agreed on that um just to touch the the eating cause of development brief has been touched on quite a lot and i agree with what um councillor cunningham said has just said just a few minute moments ago um regarding uh, when it demonstrates what he said I, I i'm agreeing with him and it demonstrates how planning policy if you like falls out of date in a in a relatively short time a, a, a relatively short space the Eden Quarters of Development brought, brief came forward in March 2015, six years ago, and a lot has changed since then. Uh, one of the key objectives that gave for the Surrey House, specifically for the Surrey House site, was key objective one was to extend the retail circuit in the town, in the town centre with a large unit appropriate for a new department store or cluster of high street high end retail units well we all know what's happened to retail then so i can fully understand why that was put in the development brief and i wasn't closely involved with it at that time and i'd like to say that if i was i would have had the foresight to see what was going to happen to retail but i don't i think i'd be lying if i said that so i, I can fully understand why that was in the brief but things have moved on so the Eden called the development brief, as I say, came forward in March 2015. Less than a year later than that, um, in February 2016, the old post office site um, the, was approved at committee. And that broke some of the, if you like, the particularly the heights designated in the Eden called the development brief, because that was for six to eight stories across the whole site, apart from the corner element, which was which is where the tower is and that was designated at nine plus stories and then shortly after that in feb in may 2016 the um eden eden walk development was 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 um that that scheme was approved at committee and again that didn't comply with the eden call of the development brief um so i i will put some weight on on the on the brief but only a, a limited way i think because i think for me things have moved on a lot in the last six years um on, on one thing i'm always keen on is design i may be a different it looks like i might be different from most on i don't know I, I really like the design particularly of building a the front the one that faces um eden street because i think it's a really i really like that design of that particular building Block B is of a similar design, but actually, I, don't, I think maybe it's because it's square and it hasn't got the count rounded ends. I'd classify that as good. And the car park building is, I suppose, okay. I can't say that that is exemplar as it is. If it got repurposed for something else, it might, it with a different facade, it might improve it a lot. I think, but as it is, it's okay. I can't go any further than that on that. 
Um, we've heard a lot of arguments about heritage assets. There are some disbenefits to that. There are there is some harm to heritage assets. I'm clearly of the opinion. I am clearly of the opinion that the benefits on this scheme outweigh the disbenefits. So I will be voting in favour. And with that, I'm going to put it to a vote. So I'm going to turn to Henry to take a named vote. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, Chair. I will now call upon each councillor in turn. Please, can you indicate how you wish to vote by saying for, against or abstain? Firstly, Councillor Archer. For. Thank you. Councillor Bailey. For. Thank you. Councillor Bainan. For. Thank you. Councillor Cunningham. For. Thank you. Councillor Dunstan. You're on mute, Councillor. Sorry, I was struggling to get off mute for. Thank you. Councillor Edwards. Um, I'm in favour and just to confirm, I've been here throughout. Thank you. Councillor George. Against. Thank you. Councillor Heap. For and I confirm I've been here for the whole meeting. Thank you. Councillor Ryder Mills. For and I too and I think all my colleagues have been there for the here for the count. Full, the full proceedings. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Mole. Yeah, I've been here. I vote against. Thank you. Councillor Self. Uh, thank you. I've been here throughout and I vote for. And we normally ask to councillors to confirm whether they've been present throughout, which I think they have, because I haven't seen anybody leave. If anybody has not been present throughout can you put your name in the chat function and we wouldn't have to disallow your vote but can you do that now i'll pause very briefly and there's no names coming up so we've all been present throughout and i yeah as i said i voted for thank you uh henry uh thank you chair to confirm that nine votes for and two against Thank you very much, Henry, and thank you to all that have been uh, indulged us in this uh, very um, important and large application, and we've obviously now voted to approve it. We will go on to the second outline application, um, and I apologise for those watching on the YouTube channel, but those of us in the meeting, we are required to be in front of our screens 100% of the time. So I'm going to call a short, uh, and it will be a short, comfort break it is now 22 22 i suggest we try and get back by 22 29 at the latest if that's okay um so we will resume for the outline application at 29 minutes past thank you
Okay, Chair, we are now live. Thank, thank you very much and welcome back, everybody. Um, before we continue with the um, second application, we will just do a very quick, we're, I'm, I'm mindful of the time, but we will do a very quick roll call just to check everybody's back, all, all members are back in the meet, meeting. So, Councillor Steph Archer. Hello, I'm here. Good. Councillor Kim Bailey. Yeah, but present, Chair. Yeah. Councillor Mark Banyan. Yep, still here. Councillor David Cunningham. Present. Councillor Lorraine Dunstan. Present. Councillor Simon Edwards. Yeah, still here. Good. Councillor Ian George. Hello. Councillor Leslie Heath. Present. Councillor Dave Ryder Mills. Here again. And Councillor Rebecca Moll. Here. Good, that's excellent. So we are all present and correct. That takes us on to the second application, which is 20 oblique 02499 oblique out for outline. Uh, this is Lever House, St. James Road, Kingston upon Thames. Um, we've had Barry's given already an, a briefing on this, so I'm not going to read out all the details of it i think we all know what it is uh, i'm going to turn straight to barry lomax to to present the his final bit of presentation on this uh, application thank you barry uh, thank you mr chairman i'm not going to go through any presentation of uh, of images i'm just going to raise the key considerations pertinent to the assessment of this application so you should be able to see my presentation on screen a first key consideration is loss of employment. Now, whilst there would be a loss of employment on the Lever uh, site uh, by the loss of Lever House, uh, subject to the applicant entering into a legal agreement to ensure that Lever House is uh, not demolished and remains available for use until such time as the employment space associated with the planning application that we've just dealt with is delivered, fitted out and then occupied, officers are satisfied that the loss of employment space, uh, employment space would be offset by increases across both sites and as a result would be in general accordance with the relevant economic employment land policies in the development plan uh, and the first application we dealt with would be subject to such uh, limitations key considerations of this scheme it would be for the delivery of up to 115 dwellings uh, would make us and that would make a significant contribution to the housing land supply in the borough a housing land supply which has become even more uh, difficult uh, in terms of numbers, given that the London plan that was adopted at the start of the month uh, has driven our housing target up from 600 odd now to 900 odd. The proposal is for a mix of units, 50% one beds, 24% two beds, 26% three beds. Uh, however, that would be uh, reassessed at the time the uh, uh, revi uh, reserved matters application would be submitted. Uh, with the intention that hopefully that figure from 26% would go upwards. However, officers having seen the viability assessment, we are confident at this point in time that 20, 26% represents uh, the maximum reasonable amount of three bed units on a viability basis. Uh, next, following detailed negotiations with officers, the development has now proposes 35% of the development based on habitable rooms as affordable. Uh, with 14% of the units secured for affordable home, home ownership. The affordable housing proposed comprises 20 social rent, uh, 20 social rent being the most affordable of the affordable housing tenures, and 16 shared ownership. Uh, key considerations again, we have the tall buildings policy, which we've covered, so I don't need to cover that in any more detail. Uh, the reasons why in this instance we think there's justified for a uh, taller building, uh, they generally resonate with the reasons that have previously been put forward. Uh, but difference here would be the provision of new housing on an underutilised under brownfield site, which in accordance to the National Planning Policy Framework would gain significant weight in and of itself. Uh, looking at the design review panel, Greater London Authority, uh, they, they raised the same concerns. Their comments were about both applications raised in one uh, comment. It's fair to say the Greater London Authority are supportive of this element of the scheme, uh, as were the design review panel. Uh, bearing in mind matters of appearance and landscaping are reserved for future consideration. It is only the scale, the layout and the access which is in front of members uh, at present. How that building is, is clothed, so to speak, would be a matter for future consideration. 
Uh, the urban design officer again uh, acknowledges the changing context of this part of the town and uh, does not raise any objections to the proposal. Uh, one of the key considerations as part of this application, in addition to the delivery of affordable homes, delivery of uh, three bed plus um, uh, units capable for family accommodation, uh, would be the comprehensive public realm upgrades to the Hogsmill River. Uh, this would be secured if members are minded to approve as part of phase two of the wider development, the outline development, and would be subject to detailed discussions through the Reserve Matters Landscaping Scheme. But what we see on, on screen in front of me now are the proposals of how that comprehensive public realm improvements uh, could be delivered. I think members, um, certainly the, the three members that I've just decided with on Monday would acknowledge that this part of the town is sadly underutilised and is somewhat of a distracting feature which could be significantly improved and this development will deliver that if permitted. Key consideration here is the heritage again. Uh, we've discussed this heritage uh, issue. Uh, what you see on screen in the two photographs on the left is the taller element of the building behind the pediment uh, of the uh, brown uh, building. Uh, I'm not sure what, um, it might be Sweaty Betty, I'm not quite sure what shop it is. Uh, one thing we have seen in the video and acknowledged by uh, our friends at Historic England is the kinetic view shows, that video shows that that tower, uh, the 16 storey building, is very quickly lost in the roofscape. Uh, it's not as present in that roofscape as the office accommodation. The office accommodation in this view is very clear. The tower is somewhat masked by the pediment, the pedimented gable of the, uh, of the building. On the right hand side, we see the building sat behind the silhouette of the Guild Hall. The officers have acknowledged that this is, is a detrimental impact of the proposal. However, what is important to bear in mind is this impact will be driven greatly if approved by the materials chosen for the tower, if it is approved. They will be subject to reserve matters applications if members were minded to approve. And the driving force would be for a light coloured material to sit behind the building so as not to ruin a silhouette. That is achievable. We see that in many places around uh, the capital where silhouettes of important historic buildings can sit in front of modern architecture without devaluing its position. But notwithstanding, we acknowledge that this does harm the setting of the Guild Hall, albeit, as we say in the report, on the spectrum it would be low down, but nonetheless it is attributed less of substantial harm and for all the reasons we've already discussed this evening, that is to be given considerable weight and importance in the decision-making process. Uh, turning to late material, late material um, covers an additional consultee response from Secretary of State, we've already covered it, the Greater London Authority, we've already covered that. A comment from Historic Royal Palaces saying they, they do not object uh, any longer to this taller element in views from uh, the Royal Palace and uh, the grounds. Uh, London Borough of Richmond uh, continue their objection in face of um, uh, Historic England and Royal Palace is not raising or supporting their objection. Kingston Neighbourhood uh, CAC maintain their objection to society, the Res Riverside Residents Association uh, at the same. Uh, we've had 10 additional neighbour objections reiterating previous uh, comments. The Kingston Neighbourhood comments are as set out. Uh, we highlight here that since the meeting of the Kingston Neighbourhood um, there has been significant uh, changes. Uh, those changes from the scheme that the neighbourhood uh, saw relate to the provision of 20 socially rented units and 16 shared ownership units. I think at the time that the neighbourhood saw the scheme, we were at 0% affordable. Uh, the scheme also has been updated to include a footpath link between uh, Wheatfield Way and Brook Street. Uh, to the north of the Hogsmill to provide some connectivity and to achieve one of the aims of the Area Action Plan, which is to increase, increase uh, the visual, um, uh, the visibility of Hogsmill. Uh, corrections in the key standards dashboard, uh, just setting out that any shortfall of public uh, or uh, amenity space, uh, play space, uh, would be secured for the older children off-site and there would be a requirement for, financial, for a financial contribution. Paragraph 47 is amended to add in the RBK view study report. Paragraph, paragraph 111, there's a slight correction there. The child yield is actually 35, not 45, and therefore the uh, play space requirements are slightly reduced. 
Uh, paragraph 235, there is an amended um, there. Um, there. There was reference to office space. That should read housing. Then we have the additional conditions about rain, water, harvesting, and the urban greening factor. Taking all those into account, Mr Chairman, uh, the recommendation is prior to the decision being issued, the application shall be referred to the Greater London Authority for their Stage 2 response and the Secretary of State for Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government and taking into account the environmental information contained within the environmental statement to approve the development subject to the completion of the relevant legal agreement as specified in the legal agreement section of the report and to delegate to the Assistant Director of Strategic Planning and Infrastructure any consequent changes to conditions and agreements to be agreed in consultation with the Chair of the Development Control Committee. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you very much, Barry. Um, we turn straight to um, uh, the objectors who wish to speak on this, who have registered to speak, which is uh, Andrea, Robin and Toby, as before. Um, so, of course, you know you've got five minutes between you, so the, we'll go straight to you. Uh, you can speak in any order as that you wish. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, Chairman, it's Toby Hiscock here. Um, I wasn't actually going to say much more. Um, my earlier comments um, address both phases of the scheme. Um, but I would just add, you know, apart from um, the contravention of law, policy and guidance, you having approved uh, phase one, which is simply not viable without you approving phase two, as set out in the uh, applicant's viability statement, it really does seem pointless for me to uh, comment further. Thanks. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Thanks, thanks for your comments. Uh, I, won't, I, I could, um, could, could, could I add something? Yeah, you're still in your five yeah. minutes, so you can yeah. do, please do go ahead. Uh, okay. Um, I'd just like to say that um, it's incredibly disappointing to face a situation where we know the London plan has been in its draft form for years to refer to the fact that it's just been approved a month ago when its text has been virtually the same for some considerable time. The plan is to, to control tall buildings around the city, and that doesn't mean to say in the absence of something being in the development plan that the council can just choose to find reasons and rationale, which you can always do, as to why this should be permitted. And I think at the heart of this is what is part of the uh, Area Action Plan 2008 is that Kingston should be looking after its distinctive historic environment and it should be safeguarded and enhanced. And if any of you on this call can tell me that these proposals enhance the historic environment, I'll be astonished, absolutely astonished. These are four tall buildings in a place where the, the report in the EQDB shows that the, the roof lines of the historic town would be compromised. And I, I think, as, as Toby said, to have this now as an outline permission, which is in and of itself abhorrent to historic England, who consider you should only go for outlines in exceptional circumstances, it's really unforgivable to be considering it in this way and to separate the applications. And I would say we as objectors were told we had five minutes in total, only to be told at quarter to six this afternoon that we had another five minutes. So apologies that our comments are not fulsome in the, in the second application, but frankly, it's quite pointless. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Um, there, there are two separate applications, of course, and we, we are obliged to consider them as two separate applications. Um, if you could, there's a lot of background noise on my computer. Is there, is there background noise on other people's? I'll just see what I've just thought it would be nice if we can see. Oh, that's or, or whatever it was, it stopped. I hopefully we're all okay now on that. Um, in that case, we turn now to the uh, applicants. Sorry, Malcolm. Hello? Excuse me, Malcolm. Can I say one thing? It's Keith Payne here. Are you, are you still within? Are they still within their five minutes? Yes, Chair. Yeah, yes, you can go ahead. Please do. 
Okay, thanks. I my battery sort of went flat, so I was sort of struggling to uh, get things together again. Um, like um, I didn't catch what Toby said for us, but uh, Andrea sort of said, uh, of course, with that um, we, you know, like we said, we hadn't uh, prepared something to say for this other one, but um, pretty much everything that we've said uh, applies because these are inextricably linked applications for one proposal. And I have to say that we've been bamboozled all the way along uh, because you have documents in one application, you have documents in another, sometimes they're duplicated, sometimes you think I've read this all before, and of course you have. Um, it's just been incredibly confusing. And, and the point about this potentially the tallest building being in an outline application, and which is reserved for anything apart from, uh, you know, um, access layout and scale i mean how can we possibly um make any comment on this uh that has any great meaning it just seems to be like writing a blank check you know if you're just going to say yes go ahead do whatever you like um you know they're just obviously going to come back and come with something based on what you're going to decide today but even worse uh, and the, the other final point if i have time is on the public realm improvements around the hogs mill well, this is our land and right from the consultation, it was put across as if this was something big and wonderful uh, that they were doing with part of their site. But it seems like a land grab to me, um, the taking down the fence between uh, their property and, and this land. And uh, at the end of the day, it's still got to be next to a very big, smelly and busy roundabout. So no matter what you do, no matter how you overstate what you're doing to this piece of land, it's always going to be a bit of a difficult to work with piece of land that really is not going to amount to much. One minute so, remaining. Oh, great. So um, we've really felt all along that this whole thing about how wonderful this little piece of land that's ours already is going to contribute to the great public realm and allow them to put this um, very profitable building up um, just seems it's, it's infuriatingly um, offensive to listen to all the time but anyway we're, we're no doubt going to hear it again tonight um i'm not going to be able to fill this time i haven't prepared something to say but keith, it has been it very has frustrating, been frustrating. Uh, keith watching. can i say one extra thing yeah uh, if i may um just to say that the building behind as you see it behind the guild hall if you use light materials when that building is in shadow it will be dark and because of the balconies on that building, it will look stripy. So I don't want anyone to, have, to be under the misapprehension that somehow it will disappear into the sky. It will not. That's time, Chair. You're on mute, Chair. Sorry, thank you very much. We move on to um, comments from the applicants. That's, uh, I think, Seb and Jonathan speaking. Um, you you have up to up, i say up to five minutes between you thank you it's just me jonathan laws this time uh, i wasn't expecting to speak twice so i'll keep it brief but i can't emphasize strongly enough that phase one and phase two are unbelievably linked the development brings 115 much needed new homes to the area perfect for young professionals families and downsizers offering different housing solutions for a variety of needs even campus will help meet the demand for affordable homes in the area, with 35% of the overall development being affordable, with 50% of these being homes for social rent and a number of these being affordable family homes. All residents will have access to an early years creche and new retail space with a cafe and our plans at ground floor, further activating the St. James Street frontage. Outdoor space is essential to wellbeing. All the homes will have large balconies and access to the newly created ground floor landscaping around the Hogsmill River. The river area will be substantially upgraded and importantly allows the town centre to meet the Hogsmill River through our site. The residential elements, which we have reduced in height from 22 to 16 storeys, is the same as the adjoining Royal Exchange. Finally, this outline application is critical to the viability of the development by allowing us to have signed a legally binding agreement on competitive terms to retain Unilever in Kingston and develop the whole island site in line with the aspirations of, of the Royal Borough. Unfortunately, phase one becomes unviable without phase two. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Um, and now it's chance for members to ask questions of the objectors if they wish. Um, are there any questions? If you have, can you put your names in the chat function, please? Do so now. I'll pause briefly. So there's no names coming up. So there's no questions for the objectors. Thank you. And similarly for the applicants, if you wish to have, ask a question of the applicants on this application, um, oh, Councillor David Cunningham, maybe you can't put your name in the chat function, but I've got you, David. You go ahead, David. But this is questions to the applicants. And again, we've got five minutes. Thank you, David. Yes. Uh, yeah. My question to the applicant is about the need for doing a nightline application. I, I appreciate that you probably have every right to put in an outline application, but I'm sure that the committee are unhappy with the situation that are these two are linked, um, that in fact, uh, that you have not tried to put in a more definitive uh, application for this residential. And it makes us very suspicious that you don't really intend to develop this tower and you're going to sell it on to somebody else and we're into a lot of um, a different um, uh, problems with somebody new so uh, while I, I'm not saying that you haven't got the right to put in an outline application would you like to explain why you put in an outline application because if you want it really to move on fast presumably uh, you've done a lot of the work on an outline scheme uh, perhaps I can answer that before uh, I defer to Barry. Um, timing. Uh, we have been up against it uh, since we opened this dialogue with Unilever as they need to relocate out of Leatherhead uh, by November uh, 2023, uh, which they hasn't, when we started the journey, didn't allow us sufficient time to actually concentrate on an outline, sorry, a detailed consent on the residential uh, as we concentrated our time and efforts on the office campus. Uh, Councillor Cunningham, uh, I'd just like to add that right from the outset, uh, there's no Machiavellian plot, make no mistake about it. We need this uh, phase two to follow very, very quickly. And the profit in phase two mortalises phase one. We agreed to script uh, up this outline application with the planning officers based on the experience of the adjoining Barclay development and the tower there on the basis that this will take quite a bit of time to engage with third parties so we followed that script and that's our intention to do so so we need to take a little bit of time out to work with, to, 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 to bring a scheme forward and to have it interrogated in the way that your officers and, and, and you as committee would like to, that, that to happen so that's our intentions there's no other agenda than this that I can assure you Thank you for that contribution or that answer. You, you came up on the screen as unknown. Could you just give us your name, please, so we know who's speaking, please? I'm terribly sorry, but, uh, Chair. My name is Barry Kitcherside. I'm registered to right. speak earlier on. It's, something's happened. Yeah, yeah I know. You, yeah. Thank, thank you. I just wanted that and it's for the, for the record. Thank you very much. Oh, apologies. That's OK. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Rebecca Moll's got a question. Thanks, Chair. Um, pleased to see the affordable, um, it says social rent. Can you clarify if that's London affordable rent, uh, which is much needed in the borough? Yes, it is. Sorry. Is that, sorry. Yeah, sorry, Kitchen. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. I don't mind who answers. <laughs> Have we had an answer to that? Sorry, did I miss it? I said yes. Uh, I said yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. It looks like that's the question, end of questions. So thank you very much. Um, and thank you to all the public participants. You may now leave the meeting and follow the rest of the proceedings on the Council's YouTube stream. So thank you all very much for coming. Thank you. Um, I'll turn to Barry um, Lomax, uh, Head of Planning. Uh, to sweep up with any comments following the, the exchange between objectors and applicants that we just said. Thank you, Barry. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Just a couple of things. The first point about the Mayor's policy in his plan, uh, that was tightened in December with uh, direction from the Secretary of State to the Mayor uh, adding into his policy. And, of course, the policy 
only becomes the policy when it's published. So you know, it's, it's somewhat irrelevant that the mayor might have been talking about tall building policies two two years ago. It's not a policy until it goes through the examination in public. It goes through the Secretary of State's process. Indeed, in this case, Secretary of State uh, issued directions tightening that policy in December, and then the, the plan was published in March. So there is a technical breach because of time. Uh, and we can't uh, skirt around that. Uh, the issue about it being in outline. Uh, yes, you're, you're right. Ordinarily, we would be looking for uh, all the details to be up front. However, cognizant of, this, of the uh, uh, relative success of the community involvement in the design of the old post office Royal Exchange scheme, uh, we wanted to afford residents the same opportunity to input into the design here. And that is only really achieved by an in principle decision with matters relating to appearance, the architectural finish of a building being reserved. That, if members permit tonight, will have to go through a whole process and we'll have to come back to this committee, more than likely, for determination. So uh, there is still a lot of scrutiny, monitoring and involvement that will go on if members were minded to approve with regards to how that building looks. Uh, with regards to that view from the Riverside, again, all these views and works will have to be re-evaluated depending on the materials which are put forward. We'll be looking at all these views and studying to make sure that the silhouette of the Guildhall is preserved and indeed the other views like the marketplace um, is, is, uh, is no, no further harm, shall I say, than what we've identified already. Uh, I, I don't want to take any more, any more of your time, Mr Chairman, so I shall leave it there and then answer any questions if anybody has me. Thank, thank you very much. We move to questions. Uh, if, if questions to officers now to Barry. If you've got any questions, you can put them in the chat function, please. There may not be any because we've covered a lot of ground already, and it doesn't look as if we will. Then, therefore, go on to um, the debate. I, and be, you, I believe Councillor Mole has a has a question, Chair. Oh, well, well, we'll still go on to the debate, but. I'll start with Rebecca, Councillor Mull, and you can put your question. We'll, we'll, we'll take, you can combine your question with a comment if you wish. We will go straight on to comments after you, your question. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. I just wondered if uh, Barry could clarify the social rent slash London affordable. Um, and if the silhouette isn't, can't be preserved, if that's possible, I don't know. I'm just trying to do all options. What will happen then? So if we approve an outline and then it finds out the guild hall can't be protected as a view, what would happen? Um, and then also, um, oh no, actually that's fine. We'll leave it for that for now. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So first, um, we are putting this forward as social rent, not London affordable rent, just to be certain. Social rent being a more affordable form of affordable rent too many words affordable there in the same sentence so social rent is a cheaper rent than london affordable rent uh, marginally but that's what uh, we are tying the developer up to in this scheme and indeed i think the developer might have misspoken because that's um, what's been put in in their application uh, with regards to the guild hall it's important that we do identify that is harm what we're looking for is to ensure that that harm is minimized and if possible neutralized through the choice of materials but for the purposes of this application now we are, identi we are identifying harm we can't shy away from that and we have to give that the considerable weight and importance that we've spoken about already but all the views would have to be rerun with materials uh, that have been chosen uh, all the um, assessments will have to be rerun re and ultimately it could land back at this committee where members will have the final say and in the knowledge of that and i'm sure uh, members of this committee would express their their desire to uh, the applicants that members of the public are involved as much as possible in that architectural detailing of any building that might be approved by this committee thank you mr chairman You're on mute, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Did you want to go straight onto a comment, Rebecca? Or yes, if I can. If yeah, please okay. do. Please yeah. do. Um, Barry actually reminded me of something that I meant to ask the um, applicant, which was um, the involvement of the public. Um, we didn't manage to turn the corner building of the old post office, the um, 
a site, the St. George's site, into a case study like we were hoping when we, when it got redesigned. But that's the kind of model if this got approved that you'd like to the applicants to see. So I hope they can hear that and take that on board. And um, th there's plenty of uh, residents who are involved as well as myself that would be happy to go through that with them. And um, if this was to be approved, I don't have much to add um, because it's, it's the same as before, except for I'd say this this element of the application bothers me more than the previous. Um, and I think the benefits of it on its own are less than the benefits of the the, the phase one. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Councillor Ryder Mills, thank you. Thank you. I was just writing my notes and uh, the last thing I wrote was the last thing that Rebecca said. Um, however, th this one is very much more evenly balanced in my mind and very much more di difficult decision for the reasons actually that, that Rebecca's just said. There are the same negatives to it, but very much fewer positives. Uh, so I, it, it is a very difficult decision to make. Yes, of course, and I forget the lady's name, my apologies, um, it does have, do damage to, uh, to our history, to our heritage. Um, as far as I know, the only city that's ever got it right is Paris, where all the, the taller stuff is, is well away from all the historic centre. But we've lost that, and we lost that with with the Royal Exchange. We lost that with the uh, Eden Walk development as well. And quite honestly, I'm hoping that Eden Walk never gets built. Uh, and they come back with something very different indeed, having registered that actually there is damage to the retail already happened. Um, two other minuses, the play space to, to refer, it's not the first development to do this, but to refer to the fact that there is inadequate play space and then say, never mind, on the other side of the dual carriageway and up the road, there's there's a children's playground. It's just not good enough. Um, I'm wondering whether the developer of the Royal Exchange said exactly the same thing. I wasn't part of this committee then, so I don't know. Uh, if they did, then that poor little playground is going to get full to busting if, they, if all the developers are using the same referral method there. Um, there seems to be a lot on light levels, which is not satisfactory. Um, however, I have to say that the bit that actually will possibly tilt my vote, but I'm still listening to others, and my vote is, is there to be balanced, um, is the social rent. We've had to... to, to drag developers kicking and shouting to get any socially rented uh, units in any developments. So this one is a breath of fresh air that they've come up with actually the form of social, the form of affordable housing that the most needy in our community might be able to afford and we can actually get somewhere with rehousing people into suitable accommodation because there's a hell of a lot of people in very unsuitable accommodation so that one is a big tick in my in my box and could be the piece that that shifts the scales in favor of it and i'm hoping that other developers are listening in and, and will take a, a similar attitude towards that thank you thank you dave i've got down simon lorraine mark and ian in that order so uh, it's Councillor Edwards to start. Thank you. Mr Chairman, can I come back Thanks. just very briefly? Sorry. Oh, yeah, please do, yeah. So it's just, I'm um, sorry, Councillor Edwards, to put across. It was just the point that Councillor Ryder Mills made about the impact on light. Uh, it's just to be certain that the greatest impact comes from the office accommodation. The impact from this element of the scheme is, is not the, um, uh, shall we say, it's not the offending party. The offending party was the office accommodation, not necessarily this tower. I just thought it was important to clarify that, Mr Chairman. My misunderstanding and apologies. Th 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 thanks for that clarification. Um, Councillor Edwards, thank you. Um, th thank you, Chair. I'll be very brief. Um, <clears throat> to, to my mind, actually, the tower is less harmful 
than the large office blocks uh, in terms of its effect, especially on the um, um, setting of the uh, marketplace. Um, I, I acknowledge the harm to the um, silhouette, um, but um, I think that's relatively modest. And so again, we come back to the planning balance. Um, uh, um, I agree wholeheartedly with Councillor Ryder Mills about the fact that we're going to get effectively some social housing and a not insignificant number of social housing units in this development. And, and I think we've also got to bear in mind, uh, as the applicants put it, the umbilical nature of these two applications. Um, and, and, and so that's why I think we, we, we really, well, I, I, I feel... Uh, very much inclined to support this application. You're on mute, Chair, on chair mute. but I, I guess you're letting me speak uh, now. I do apologize. <laughs> Please continue. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, I, again, I'm going to be very brief. Um, I'm not a fan of high rise. Um, but I think the problem we've got is that um, with the surrounding developments going up as well, it's sort of compassed in one area. Um, but I have to say, I was really pleased that there was a reduction in the height. So I think the, the conversations that went on from the officers and the developers to try to reduce that um, has been very welcomed. Um, and obviously the inclusion of the affordable housing um has uh brought that back as well but um yeah i'm still open and listening but um i am going towards um being in favor at this stage thank you thank you chair well, th thank th thank you very much and i have got my microphone on this time um councillor banyan thank you <clears throat> thank you chair um uh well yeah i was just going to say about the affordable i think um you know, from a council's point of view, I, I think one kind of uh, dwelling with social rent is worth a, a lot more than one at uh, shared ownership. So I don't know if, the, I mean, even if, if we, I mean, I think it's good for, compared to most of the schemes that come to, to us. Well, I don't, think, I don't think I've seen any schemes that are offering such a high proportion of social rent. So I think that's good. I mean, even I was just thinking, is it possible if they were to reduce, you know, um, potentially even reduce the overall amount of social of affordable housing slightly, but increase the social rent? I, I would be in favour of that if that's something that's possible. So I think social rent is so much more like we talk about affordable, quote unquote, but I don't think that a lot of affordable isn't genuinely affordable. I think social rent is very much something that as a council, we, you know, we encourage and it helps the people who are really, really struggling to get the housing ladder. Um, so yeah, I mean, if that was if that was possible, then I would yeah, be in favour of that. I don't know if that's something we put forward, or if the developers are listening, then you know that's something that I would be yeah, I, I would encourage. Um, but yeah, that was uh, that was it for now. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Mark. Uh, and finally, before we go to a vote, I've got Councillor George. Thank you. I'll, I'll be really quick. Uh, yeah, I, I'm a bit. I don't know, I think it's a bit odd that people are starting to get a bit confused. We, we always knew this was intrinsically linked with the, with the other one. I, I, that's no surprise. Um, I think this, the social rent, the amount of social rent, I think that's a very, I think that's a win. You know, I think that we're, we're, we're you know, we, we, you, you'd like to get that in everything and um, we're lucky to get it on this and done well. The play space has been mentioned and, and, and we've gone out, you know, I think um, officers have followed um Lib Dem councillors views that we should have lots of three bedroom more three bedrooms and they've gone out and, they, and, that, and that's another win apparently however if we start talking about play space and lack of play space and having to cross dual carriageway to get to the, the gardens personally I, I although there's a need for three bedroom places should we be getting three bedroom places everywhere quite frankly somewhere like this is not ideal for families you know and, and, and of course you know lots of families do live in built up areas but it's not ideal perhaps we should be looking at having more three bed places at, at, at better places for, for, for families where, where they don't have to cross the dual carriageway where there's not so much 
air pollution about. Um, I, I think there's this idea of just having this set view of having three bedrooms, as many as we can everywhere, is, is wrong, in my opinion. Um, the officer said that, you know, all we're, all we're agreeing is, is what's in front of us, which is right, and it, we'll have plenty of time because it'll be coming back to look at materials. It's still going to be that size, you know. Um, materials, it, it, materials can make a difference, of course, but quite frankly, we're saying that size, you are, in my opinion, you know, you're talking about putting a lipstick on a pig because you can't hide it. Thank you. Thank you, Ian, and for that thought of lipstick on a pig. Thank you. Um, yeah, we are going to go to a vote. Uh, I should be voting for this application. I I, I, I thought long and hard on it. Um, I, personally, I'm not against tall buildings, and it's a case of this is the right, is this the right location for a tall building? Well. Um, I think it ticks a lot of boxes, uh, and I, but I can understand the uh, views of people that don't want a such a tall building there. Uh, as, as Lorraine said, it has reduced in height from when it came in from 22 storeys to 16 storeys, and we are achieving social housing, something which is, I think is the first for the borough for very many years, um, actual, actual social housing as opposed to London affordable, although they are close. Um, the shared ownership i've done a lot of research on in the last couple of months and there is a need for it it does fit a market i would have i would prefer yeah less shared ownership and and with an upgrade to the social so i sort of mirror what mark was saying on on that but the shared ownership it does it, it does suit some people and it can work it doesn't always work but it can work um so I wouldn't certainly wouldn't dismiss that. The three bed unit, I do have to. Well, I've got a different view from Councillor George. I do think we need three bed units. I've got friends, quite close friends, that we got in Madrid, in Spain, who their family home has always been in a flat in the centre of the town, and without, well, they have got a balcony, but it's not. It's certainly not a large balcony, and it's if they want open space, they have to go off into the street off to a local park and they seem to cope with it pretty well. So um, uh, it's up to families, I suppose, whether they would want to live there or not. But I do think that, that, that I would press for the three bed units. And so when this comes back for reserve matters, I, I can say now I would be looking for a reduction in the number of one bed units, which is currently 57, and then increase in the number of certainly the number of two bed as opposed to one bed if not three bed um with that i'm going to put it to the vote um so it's over to you henry thank you chair i'll now call upon each councillor in turn please can you indicate how you wish to vote by saying for against or abstain please can you also confirm that you've been present for the duration of the meeting firstly councillor archer i've been present throughout and i vote for Thank you. Councillor Bailey. I vote for and I've been present throughout. Thank you. Councillor Bainan. Yeah, I've been present throughout the meeting and I vote for. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cunningham. I've been present for the meeting and I vote for. Thank you. Councillor Dunstan. I've been present throughout the meeting and I vote for. Thank you. Councillor Edwards. Um, I too have been present throughout this item um, and indeed the whole meeting and I'm in favour. Thank you. Councillor George. Uh, here throughout and against. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Heap. I've been here throughout the meeting and I vote for. Thank you. Councillor Ryder Mills. Present throughout the meeting with a dicky microphone turn on i vote for thank you councillor mole present throughout and i vote against thank you and lastly the chair councillor self i've been present throughout and i vote for thank you all just confirm that nine votes for and two against over to you chair thank you very much so that is um approved by this committee 
Um, that takes us to urgent items. You'll be pleased to know at 23.15, there are no urgent items. So I close the meeting at, indeed, 11.15. And thank you all very much for, and for attending, members, officers, and all the registered speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you.